Oh, yeah. lights action camera. And yet, surprisingly, oh, they wanted to remind you to remind people to speak into the mic and to the, the day -to -day mic stuff when they're when they're talking. When their operation is done by a small board, they never get to talk. What is this? You got me. It's done by it. you said. Yeah, it's that you didn't get to go to that. Yeah, stuff is handled by the board of review. Thanks a lot. Yeah. How are you doing? Amir. I haven't had a chance to see Happy New Year to you. I was not feeling it. The first part of my term in January. Do another three years or not. I'm trying to do a more detailed analysis. Just fine. And last year. I brought mine. Yeah, I know. So was this well attended by all the members? Go on. Yeah. Put those notes down. I'm not sure that we get those. Yeah, I got them. I should be getting them. I got them in email. Well, I'm so far out. Our internet service is kind of, you know, still iffy up in that part of the county. So I. There you go. I want to see the MPL process be able to move. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Durham Planning Commission. It's good to have you here this evening. The members of the Durham Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and the County Commissioners as an advisory board to the elected officials. So you should know that the elected officials will have the final say on any of the issues before us this evening. If you wish to speak on an agenda item this evening, we encourage you to please come up and sign up on the table to my left. Uh, you'll notice it'll have the look for the specific case number that you wish to speak on. And you can put down your name, your address, and then let us know if you're speaking in favor or against the particular proposal. Uh, we will call you up when it is time to speak on that public hearing item. We'll ask you to come up and speak clearly into the microphone and give us your name, your address, and we will allow 10 minutes for each side, those in speaking in favor, those speaking against the particular proposal that's in front of us this evening. Uh, finally, all motions that you'll hear will be stated in the affirmative. So if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. And then finally, on tonight's meeting agenda, you'll see at the very end, we have two items that are informational items only this evening. And so that means we'll be getting a presentation on that item tonight, and the commissioners will have time to ask any questions or offer any comments. But those items will be coming back at a future meeting where there will be uh, the opportunity for public input. So if those are items that interest you, we're glad you're here tonight to get the information with us, but we encourage you to then come back at a future meeting so you can offer your public comments. So thanks again for coming. May we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Alturk? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Absent. Commissioner Baker? Absent. Commissioner Brine? Here. Commissioner Satterfield is excused? Commissioner Satterfield is excused. Commissioner Baker is about 15 minutes late, he said. He'll be here. Uh, Commissioner Durkin? Here. Commissioner Hyman? Present. Chair Busby? Here. Commissioner Miller? Here. Commissioner Ketchen? Here. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Present. <clears throat> Commissioner Mer uh, Morgan? Here. Commissioner Gibbs? Here. And Commissioner Williams? Here.
Can we have a motion to officially excuse Commissioner Satterfield? So moved. Second. second. <clears throat> Properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And we'll, we'll make sure we recognize Commissioner Baker when he arrives. Uh, approval of the minutes and the consistency statements. This is from our November 13th, 2018 meeting. Commissioner Bryan. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have minor correction to the minutes. Uh, at our November meeting, Laura Woods presented the evaluation and assessment report, and Scott Whiteman gave us an update, and neither one of those staff members are listed under staff being present. Um, that's noted. Thank you for those. Any other adjustments to the minutes or the consistency statements? I have a comment. Uh, I, but I, I think it's already been somewhat corrected, but I was going to suggest that uh, Commissioner Durkin's name be, she, she deserves a, a place to her own, but for the past, oh, couple months, she's been listed next to, uh, uh, shoot, she's been listed next to the chairman, uh, but I see. We'll pay attention to that. Thank you. All right. We'll pay attention in the future and make sure we don't do that. All right. <laughs> if there aren't any other adjustments, we'll take a motion for approval. I'll move approval of the minutes and consistency statements as amended. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, before we get to any adjustments to the agenda, I did want to take a moment and welcome our newest commissioner, David Morgan. And this is David's first meeting, so welcome aboard. And David, as you know, this was our December meeting. You actually showed up, and it was canceled because of bad weather. So we already admire your commitment, <laughs> and we, uh, we appreciate your rapid fire since our regular meeting will be on Tuesday. But uh, you're welcome to, to have the floor and make any welcoming remarks. Just wanted to say I was glad to be on the board and, uh, and look forward to uh, serving with you all. Great. Thank you very much. Ms. Smith, any adjustments to tonight's agenda? Um, um, Commissioner Busby, no. The staff has no adjustments to the agenda. Um, we would just like to add that all um, legal requirements have been uh, carried out in accordance with state and local law uh, for notifications, and those affidavits are on file in the planning department. Great, thank you very much. Commissioner Bryan? I move adoption of the agenda as presented. Second. Okay. Motion and second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Great, we will move forward. So again, tonight we have three zoning map changes, and then we have our two information items. And a reminder, we will meet again on Tuesday, which is our regular meeting. This is the meeting to make up for the December 11th meeting that was canceled because of the snow. So our first item is case Z18-00024. This is King's Daughters Inn. And we will start with the staff report. And again, if you are interested in signing up to speak on any of these items, please do so. Thank you. Good evening, Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. I will be presenting case Z18-00024, King's Daughters Inn. The applicant is Colin Crossman. This 0.603 acre site is located at 204 North Buchanan Boulevard. The site is located within the city's limits. The applicant proposes to change the zoning from RU5 and RUM to RUM. There is no development plan associated with this request. The property is designated medium density residential on the future land use map, which is consistent with the zoning request. The proposed RUM zoning request allows for a wider range of permissible housing types and would allow a potential future multifamily residential conversion of the existing bed and breakfast. Sorry, I meant to show you that slide a minute ago. The site is shown in red, located at the corner of North Buchanan Boulevard 
and Gloria Avenue and is located in the urban tier. Photos one and two show the existing site conditions. The structure is currently used as a bed and breakfast. The site is designated local historic landmark and any improvements to the building will, be, will require a certificate of appropriateness. The site is adjacent to multifamily and single family residential uses and Duke University is located to the west. The applicant proposes to change the RU5 and RUM zoning to RUM. The property is designated medium density residential on the future land use map, which is consistent with the zoning re rezoning request. And the dimensional standards are shown here. Maximum density without a development plan is 12 units per acre. The minimum lot width is 75 feet. The minimum street yard is five feet, side yard eight feet, and rear yard setback 20 feet. The proposed RUM zoning designation complies with current medium density residential designation on the future land use map and applicable policies. It is consistent with policies 2.3.1a as the proposed RUM zoning is adjacent to existing RUM zoning. With respect to 2.3.2a, existing infrastructure such as road, water, and sewer capacity are sufficient to accommodate potential impacts. Further details provided in the zoning map change report. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances. The staff is available for any questions. Thank you very much. So at this point, we will move to open the public hearing. And we have two individuals who are signed up to speak in favor. We have Mr. Dan Jewell and uh, against or requesting a continuance, as it says here, is Stacy Morgan Murphy. So each side will have 10 minutes. I'm guessing we're not going to need that much. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the uh, commission, Dan Jewell, uh, I'm going to let Ms. Uh, Murphy go first, uh, make her uh, request, and uh, just to let you know, I am here at, uh, on behalf of the applicant, and we are in agreement with the request that she's about to make. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Stacy Murphy. I'll keep this brief. Um, the Trinity Park Board has met, we've met tw uh, a total of three times to discuss this issue. Um, one in our December meeting in which some concerned neighbors came and brought it to our attention. Um, then we had a snowstorm. Then um, a smaller subcommittee met to go through the details. Then we had the holidays about us. And um, one thing that the board is certainly in agreement is that it, it is a complicated uh, property to kind of get your head around all the different issues and covenants. There's some specific covenants on the deed of sale with that property that offers some protections. There's a historic landmark um, demarcation which offers certain protections and restrictions. And then there's um, the zoning changes which opens up and alleviates some kind of additional possibilities for the potential sa sale of this property. Um, so it's a complicated issue. I think there's, um, the board is kind of, uh, getting understanding of it, but because it is such a complicated issue and we had the snowstorm and the holidays, we feel like it would be better for everyone if there was a little bit more time for the neighborhood and immediate neighbors to get additional understanding and understand how all these three different kind of restrictive properties work together. And um, I feel confident that if a 30 day continuance was achieved that we could, we could get that understanding and, and be at a, a better position, so. Great, thank you. Mr. Jewell? Yeah. Again, Dan Jewell, uh, representing the applicants, the Crossmans. Uh, yes, we are, in, we are in agreement with a, uh, with a one cycle continuance of this for the neighbors to have a little more internal discussion. Also a question for the commission. Um, we can make the restricted covenants uh, available uh, at the next meeting if you would like to see those. Uh, those, among other things, um, prevent the tearing down of the existing historic building and also uh, would not allow any undergraduate housing in the building. So we can provide those if, if, if it would be helpful here to see those. I think it, it's always great sure. to have more information and you can probably work with the staff and they can convey that information to us as appropriate. Happy to do that. Thank you. Great. Thank you both very much.
Is there anyone else who would like to speak at this evening's public hearing? This is the King's Daughter Inn case. Uh, before we move forward, I would just want to check in with staff, and I do want to clarify this is a little unique, as I said earlier. We are meeting again on Tuesday, so we are talking about continuing this until the February 12th meeting, just so we're all on the same page. But yeah, we were going to suggest you at least take it to that meeting and not to Tuesday. <laughs> so I will, should I, do I need just to check on the, the procedures? So do we want to make sure we keep this public hearing open? You have to open? keep it open and you continue it until the date certain, which would be February 12th. And I believe Mr. Miller had something he wanted to add. Yeah, you do that. Mr. Commissioner Miller. Before we vote or take any action on something, it occurred to me, uh, uh, while the Trinity Park folks are making their presentation, uh, she, you mentioned historic preservation covenants, which are not zoning matters. Um, and I believe this, the owners of this property have granted covenants to preservation Durham. Uh, and that being the case, I thought it uh, fair to disclose to all of you and to those of you who are concerned with this matter that I currently sit on the board of preservation Durham which is the organization which I believe uh, has these covenants. I, I do not think that anything, any action that could be taken by the Planning Commission or ultimately the City Council with regard to the zoning of this property would affect those covenants. But I did think it, and I don't think I'm required by the rules after consultation with staff to recuse myself because of this connection. But I did think it was only fair out of an abundance of caution that I make this disclosure to you so that it, in time, if it's necessary for me to comment, you can measure those comments knowing that I am connected with an organization that has uh, a connection to or an interest in this property. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Any other questions or comments, Commissioner Bryan? I was just going to make a motion if you're ready. I, I believe we are. I move that we open the public hearing and continue the matter until the February 12th meeting of the commission. Second. Moved by Commissioner Bryan, seconded by Commissioner Hornbuckle, and we'll have a roll call vote. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Uh, Commissioner Bryan? Yes. Commissioner Satterfield? Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Hyman? Yes. Chair Busby? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Ketchen? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Motion passes 11 to 0. Great. Thank you very much. And we, we appreciate everyone taking time to work this issue out. And we'll see you on February 12th. I just want to make sure we recognize Commissioner Johnson. Good to have you here. Uh, we will move to our next item. This is case Z180026, Kale Street Duplex. And we will start with the staff report. Good evening, Emily Strothers again with the Planning Department. I will now be presenting case Z180026, Hale Street Duplex. The applicant is Martin McFarling. This 0.345 acre site is located at 1020 Hale Street and is comprised of two lots. This site is located within the city limits. The applicant proposes to change the zoning from RU5 to RU52. There is no development plan associated with this request. The property is designated medium density residential on the future land use map, which is consistent with the zoning request. The proposed RU52 allows for duplexes, which would allow for an existing duplex on lot 139 to become conforming and for the construction of a new duplex lot on 141. The site is shown in red, located off of Hale Street within the Old West Durham Neighborhood Protection Overlay and in the urban tier. Photos one and two show the existing site conditions. 
Lot 139 has an existing duplex structure and Lot 141 is currently vacant. The site is adjacent to single family and duplex residential uses. The applicant proposes to change the RU5 zoning to RU52. The property is designated medium density residential on the future land use map, which is consistent with the rezoning request. Dimensional standards within the RU52 zoning are primarily determined by housing type, as identified in UDO section 7.1. As this site falls within the Old West Durham Neighborhood Protection Overlay, it is subject to those requirements, including the following dimensional standards. Maximum lot area, 12,000 square feet. Minimum lot width, 50 feet. Maximum height, I'm sorry. Maximum height, 26 feet. Maximum floor area ratio, 0.325. The proposed RU52 zoning designation complies with the current medium density residential designation on the future land use map and applicable policies. It is consistent with policy 2.31A as the proposed RU52 zoning is adjacent to existing RU52 zoning and existing duplex structures. With respect to 2.3.2A, existing infrastructure such as road, water, and sewer capacity are sufficient to accommodate potential impacts. Further details provided in the zoning map change report. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances. Staff is available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Struthers. We will move to open the public hearing, and we have three individuals who signed up to speak. Marty McFarling in favor, and two opposed, Joe Arlinghouse and William Whitmore. So we will start with Mr. McFarling and each side will have 10 minutes total. Good evening, Commissioner. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. I'm Marty McFarlane. I reside at uh, 5014 Renville Drive in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, though I did grow up in Durham and used to live at 1020 Hale Street at one time before I moved to Greensboro. Um, I think the proposal is pretty clear what I'm asking for. Currently, uh, there is a duplex behind uh, my property. My property currently has one duplex on one lot, which is non-conforming. That was done in 1959. The other lot has been vacant ever since that lot was surveyed in 1911. Never has been built on. It's wild having a 100-year-old lot in Old West Durham never built on. Um, Basically, there's three reasons that I'm coming to the city to do this, or to the commissioners here and then the city. Number one is to correct the non-conforming status of the existing duplex sitting there. Of course, if that duplex were to burn more than 50%, uh, Old West Durham's then lost the duplex in its housing stock. I can only rebuild with a single family without, uh, I may be able to get a duplex redone, but from what I understand from the planning people, um, there's a lot involved with trying to do that and get variances and whatever else would have to be involved. Uh, the second purpose for this uh, on the empty lot is to provide a senior friendly housing unit that's a duplex for a caregiver and my 87 year old father who currently lives on Carver Street. The third purpose for this request is the highest and best use after owning this piece of property for over 30 years now is uh, that the city will allow is an RU5-2 zoning. Um, RUM would be better in allowing me to put a nice looking fourplex up, <laughs> which I actually went to the trouble of getting some uh, information put on and done for on a plat. But to do that, I would have to tear, I would have to tear down the existing duplex and basically build the fourplex in the middle of the two lots, which is, you know, you're spinning your wheels doing that. Of course, everything with this, uh, as I work on the development plan to actually get this done, is going to have to now conform to the new NPO there in Old West Durham, which will make things interesting, but I still see how it can be done. And um, that's basically it. So, any questions? I'd like to save my last little bit of time for maybe a rebuttal, if that's possible. That's fair. If there's any needed, okay. Thank you very much. And so, Mr. Arlinghouse and Mr. Whitmore, you have a total of 10 minutes if you would like to use that. Okay. 
Good evening. I'm Joe Arlinghouse. I live at uh, 1019 Hale Street, which is directly across the street from the property in question. Um, I am opposed to changing the zoning. I have some neighbors who have lived there for years, uh, and the duplexes, especially the duplex across the street from me, it, the people are uh, transients. You know, they, they're there maybe a year or so, and then we get somebody else. So in terms of the aesthetics and the quality of life, for me, since I'm looking from my living room directly at the property in question, um, and also in terms of building neighborhood community, it would be far better if we had consistently more uh, single family residences occupied by the owners in the neighborhood. That's ideally what I would like to see. Um, I think that would greatly enhance the, the quality of life. And I, I do worry about the what might be built there because I've seen so many houses, many of which have been built by Jeff Monsine that are really quite huge and led us in the neighborhood to put together the NPO that was basically ratified by the city council. So um, we'll see what the city decides, but I think the single family residence is by, occupied by owners is the best solution to our neighborhood. Thank you. Mr. Whitmore. Hi, I'm, I'm William Whitmore. I live at 2101 Inglewood Avenue, which is a property behind the, uh, the property in question. And I'm, I'm sort of echoing what um, Joe Arlinghouse was saying is, I think that the strength of our neighborhood is the mix between the uh, duplexes and the single family, the housing. And um, at this point, we have a duplex on the lot next to that lot. There's one across. There's a house that's next to that that functions as a duplex. And then behind, behind there, there are two other duplexes. So I would rather that the lot be developed the way the zoning is there. I mean, I have no objections to developing the lot, um, you know, splitting it and developing it. But I would rather it stay the way it was originally zoned and be a single family uh, dwelling, which you know would fulfill your desires to increase the the density there, but but also you know keep the the neighborhood character the same. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. McFarling. It, you did have additional time if you did want to make any additional remarks, and then. Uh, when we do close the public comment period, the commissioners may have direct questions and may ask each of you to come answer a very specific question. They may not, but just so you're, uh, you're ready. Uh, thank you. About eight minutes. Okay, great. Um, I've owned that property since the mid-'80s. I think you can tell by the picture that it's kept up pretty well. The house was built in the 20s. I've never really done any major work on the outside. Uh, I think I'm a good landlord in so far as um, having affordable housing that uh, right now, let's see, the one-bedroom unit in that existing duplex rents for 800 a month. The two-bedroom unit rents for 1050 a month. That's kind of below what's normal right now in Old West Durham. Uh, the fact that I hopefully will be able to add a second duplex to the empty lot, which already has a duplex behind it, and then the gentleman, Joe, uh, Mr. Erringhaus that spoke, has a duplex right beside him that is across the lot or across the street from the existing duplex that I have on the lot. His house is across from the vacant lot. Um, you know, I'm trying to provide something here uh, for my father and later in his life for his quality of life. And then once my father is no longer on this earth, there's going to be a nice duplex dwelling unit there that I will probably live in till the day I die. By the way, 
Uh, dad's 87, granddad died at 99, great granddad at 108. So I'm gonna probably be around for a while. <laughs> so I need a place to live when I get older. <laughs> but um, that's the main thing is having something like that available. And then as we can see, because um, it's the same way with everything else in that neighborhood, properties get improved. And um, you know, it, it gives the housing stock something to continue the old West Durham um, aura, I guess, so to speak. Uh, yes, rental tenants are transient because most of the rental tenants I deal with are MBA students at Duke University or young professionals and MBA students graduate and move on and young professionals start having babies and don't have enough room in a one or two bedroom uh, duplex. So uh, it is a little bit transient, but overall, my goal as a landlord is try to keep a rental tenant there as long as possible. I've got one that just turned over on Carolina. It's gonna be empty for a month. That's $800 that's not coming in my pocket for a month. Uh, I don't like to have empty units. So um, in regards to basically being able to bring some more housing stock to Old West Durham, which desperately needs it, I provide that housing stock at a rather affordable rate since I was able to purchase those houses 30 years ago at a um, realistic price. Um, you know, I. I feel very strongly in favor of this. I'm sorry that my neighbor, my two neighbors uh, have some problems with it. I have spoke to other neighbors in the neighborhood and they do not have a problem with it whatsoever. So if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer some. Thank you. Is there anyone else that'd like to speak on this item? I don't see anyone else. So we're gonna close the public hearing and any questions or comments from my fellow commissioners? I'll start with Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, and pardon my tardiness tonight. Uh, I have multiple questions, but I'll just ask one in hopes that my colleagues will hopefully raise the other one. So for the two gentlemen who are in opposition to the request here, uh, would you mind one or both uh, coming to the, the microphone? And I'm wondering or curious if you would respond to what are your thoughts on the future land use map, which has this entire neighborhood that's uh, designated for medium density residential, given your concerns about you know the transient nature, and I'm assuming that if you're not a single, if you're not a homeowner, then you're assuming that that's associated with more transient type behavior. Uh, but given that the future land use map has this as medium density residential as a zoning, uh, as a designation, that to me seems that that would actually introduce more transient type residents of this neighborhood. So what are your thoughts on that? I, mean, I think in the single family zoning part of that, that plan, is that, okay. I'm sorry, isn't single family uh, dwelling part of that plan? I, I mean, I, like I said, I, I, I'm fine with the lot being split and another house being built there, I would just rather it be a single family house rather than a duplex, which you know is more likely to have someone buy it and live there for years and years, although it might actually be a rental that you know somebody lives there a couple of years and moves out. Right. I mean, I, I, you know, I like people coming and going in the neighborhood. I'm not, I'm, I just feel like that, that it wouldn't, it, that the, the neighborhood would be better, is you know strong because we have a good mix between single family and owner occupied and rentals and duplexes and that I would rather stay the way it, it's zoned now, which is for single family rather than continuing to zone in more duplexes. I, I mean, I don't think that you get that many more people in there because you have a duplex. You know, you, a duplex on either side like might have three people in there, and a family will have you know, two adults and three kids or something like that. Right. So it's not like you're, you're, you're suddenly getting more people in there after you develop the lot. You know, if you don't develop the lot, then. Right, so quick follow-up to, to those comments. And so, so based on my understanding, so the future land use map has this as medium density residential, which allows six to 12 dwelling units per acre. And so just with this proposal here, mm -hmm. which is around 3.45, that calculates to around two to four dwelling units that could be on that single park, that parcel itself, based on the future land use map. And so I'm just looking ahead based on the, com uh, the comments that you two gentlemen made. And so 
in that case, you are basically like two to four people won't be homeowners, single homeowners on 3.45 acre lot. And so it seems to go against, it seems to contrast the opposition points that you made. And so I'm just wondering if you're seeing this as a potential issue for your neighborhood based on the request tonight. And maybe I was, so I if someone I came I guess before, I don't see my neighborhood being raised to increase the density there. I think that the housing stock that's there is gonna stay there for. That's an assumption, and, and so my final, so that's yeah. an assumption, but I could come into your neighborhood, buy a property for, for whatever reason, and knock it down, or it burns down, right. or something happens, and I could come before the commission at whatever point in the future and use this future land use map as a way to go from a single occupied, single family resident residential unit to a more dense use with my rebuild, with my redevelopment. And so I'm just wondering, have you have you two taken that reality into account? Yeah, but you you would also have to come down and ask for a zoning change, right. right? And that's where we would discuss what was there and what was good for the neighborhood. So okay. it would be a possibility, but okay. you know. It, you know, I mean, you know, it is a possibility, but it's not, you can't do it just because you want to do it. You, you're going to have to go through this commission and through the city council and, you know, the neighborhood association will be involved and everyone will talk about what's best for the neighborhood and what. That's fair. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Al Turk. Thank you, Chair. Um, and actually, if, and just the. I would ask if, if folks are having side conversations, it's a little hard to hear up here. You're welcome to go into the hall if it's going to be a loud conversation. That would allow us to be able to hear the conversation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm generally supportive of this request. Um, I think that having a, a duplex on this 0.172 acre lot, lot 141, makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, the neighborhood, I mean, you talk about neighborhood character. Um, I think right now, my guess is a lot of Old West Durham, maybe majority or maybe not a majority of lots have duplexes, but a lot of them do, right? Uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, people who rent in the neighborhood, and I, um, I'm not sure that that necessarily takes away from the character of the neighborhood. I, I think there are other things that uh, give the neighborhood character. So, I, I, so to me, I think it's a reasonable request for for one particular for one or two main reasons. Uh, one is that w one thing that we're going to be discussing later today is that we have a shortage of housing for one bedroom units, right? For people who just need one bedroom, two bedrooms in this in the in the city. And so, uh, to me, anything that increases the density while taking into account the character of the neighborhood is a good thing. And so, I think having a duplex here makes sense. Um, the other thing is, I think that this is the kind of thing that is good, you know, it, um, the fact that we have an NPO um, here is a good thing, and or it's, uh, I think this is what we intended when we, when we passed the NPO, something like this, right, to increase the density while still taking into consideration the, the character. And so one of the things that you mentioned, or one, one of you mentioned, I can't remember who, is that you don't want to see something that's massive, you know, a massive uh, house, right? Because it, it wouldn't fit. Well, as, as I see it here, right, lot 141 is 74, 94 square feet. Is that about right? Um, and because we now have an NPO that, that says you can only build up to 0.325% or 32.5% uh, of the the, the lot area, that translates to a maximum of a 2,400 square foot house duplex in this case. So I think that's a reasonable size home in, in Old West Durham. You know, it might be on the larger side, but that's the maximum, right, that someone can build on this lot. Um, so to me, that would, you know, that, that's a reasonable size duplex. Um, so again, I think increased density, reasonable increased density in this neighborhood makes sense and, and for that reason, I'm, I'm generally supportive of this, of this request. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bryan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would like to just simply say put ditto marks under what my fellow commissioner just said. I am also supportive of this particular request. 
I will add that one reason it can, uh, will correct a non-conforming use, uh, and as we're going to hear later, uh, if some of the proposals, and I believe they're still, that may, I don't know whether they took down the boards that were out in the hall previously about extending housing types in Durham, but putting duplexes in various places where they haven't been allowed previously is something that's going to be proposed. And had that already been in effect, this rezoning would be totally unnecessary because it would be allowed by right. Uh, and I also echo uh, Mr. Altark's uh, comment. There is some protection added by the MPO, so some of the things that may have seemed out of hand before can't happen anymore. So that's all. Thank you. And gentlemen, you're welcome to sit down. We'll call you back up if, you're, if there are any other questions for you. Commissioner Miller? So I have some questions for staff. So if I recall the NPO correctly, and I'm not saying that I necessarily do, it has a uh, FAR limit of 32.5, but then without regard to lot size, there is a certain uh, minimum square footage that would be allowed even if the lot were smaller, say, than 7,500 square feet. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. So regardless of the calculated FAR, each parcel shall be allowed a minimum of 2,200 square feet of floor area, and no parcel shall exceed 3,600 square feet of floor area. So right. So those are the, the outside limits. Uh, the other thing I remember from our MPO discussions is, is that for Old West Durham generally, um, perhaps unlike some other single-family neighborhoods, it actually conforms to the medium density residential uh, requirement of the comprehensive land use plan in the insofar as that the the average density throughout the neighborhood is probably uh, between somewhere between six and eight dwelling units per acre is that correct i am unable to confirm that i will um generally per sarah young is that so is it my remembering it seems to me i heard people say in seven or something but i might be misremembering Sarah Young with the planning department. It's somewhere in there. I don't remember the exact number. But it's more than but six. I believe so. Right. Um, and of course, there's no guarantee that if this rezoning goes through that what will be built there will be affordable. Um, although I appreciate uh, Mr. McFarland's uh, indication that that's his intention. Uh, we can't vote based upon that expectation. Uh, I also am concerned about what may happen on this piece of property if we change the zoning to RU52, uh, if the expanding housing choices proposals that are now out there uh, pass. This property is essentially 99 feet wide, the two parcels together, uh, under the RU52 minimum lot sizes in the proposal for expanding housing choices. What would be the minimum lot width? Can you answer that for RU52? So the minimum lot width is um, guided by the Old West, Old West Durham Neighborhood Protection Overlay in this area, I believe. No, no, I'm talking about if expanding housing choices. I would defer to uh, Mike Stock on that one. I'm a little confused about how the NPO and, and expanding housing choices will work together if the expanding housing choices proposal pass as they are proposed. We will have, we will be proposing amendments to both NPOs um, that are on the books to make sure there's not conflicts between the changes that are being proposed for expanding housing choices. And we'll be, we are meeting with the, and those neighborhood associations this month about it. So what would, if, if what's currently proposed is passed for RU52, what would be the minimum lot width? Uh, the proposal that I believe we're moving forward with would be a 35-foot wide, wide, sorry, W, not L, uh, wide lot width and a 3,500-square-foot lot area. Right. So it would still be two lots. These two lots would continue to be two lots. You couldn't squeeze a third one in there. Probably not. not unless, unless, you did, square feet. unless you did a... Very small. There's a proposal. We'll get into it later. Flag lot at the like back, like a flag lot or a small house, where you're limited even further by the. Um, if you do a small lot, you're limited to the small a small house kind of thing. Under the current 
assume going back to the current zoning, if this were to go to RU52, we'll strike that. Uh, under the current zoning where this is uh, RU5, uh, under the NPO that's been adopted, you can build ADU for each of these two properties. Correct, with a single family. No, no, no. If there's a duplex on it, you couldn't do an ADU. Even a non-conforming one? Correct. So that, that, that is being proposed for change also. So that would be for the one lot. But if on the vacant lot, there's nothing ab about the way the property is currently configured that would prevent the applicant from building a single family home on the vacant lot. Correct. Is there? As far as we know, Correct. yes. And it could have an ADU. Correct. And how big could that ADU be? The measurement is 30% of the primary, 30% of the area of the primary structure. So we would have to work the calculus with the 22.5 and that comes out to essentially being a short third. There, there's some, there are some additional provisions. I'm sorry, there are, I forgot there are some additional provisions per the NPO that would yeah, supersede that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the NPO allows you to go up more, it's more than it's the, a little the, bit more permissive than, but it talks about accessory structures as a whole, not just accessory dwelling units. So instead of building a duplex on this piece of property, which would not allow an ADU, you could have a single family home and an ADU, and that ADU could be detached or attached. Per current requirements, yes. Um, thank you. Those are my questions to staff. So actually, I oppose this rezoning. One is. There's a lot up in the air for how things are going to work in this neighborhood in the future, uh, especially as it relates to the RU52 um, zoning category. Right now, this neighborhood is divided between uh, RU5 and RU52, the duplex zone. Most of the neighborhood is RU5, some of it is RU52. Um, and so I would say it's fair to characterize the neighborhood, which I'm very familiar, as being mostly single-family homes, but some of it uh, definitely uh, involve clusters of duplexes. It is my general feeling and general rule uh, that zoning boundaries in residential areas should run along backlot lines and not down the centers of streets. Um, in terms of compatibility and community building, um, I think it works better uh, if we use backlot lines. and because of that, and because this would change that, this would bring uh, different zoning types across the street from each other, uh, which I generally oppose. And because this neighborhood has a new NPO, which really hasn't, nobody knows how it's going to work, and now it already has to, may already have to be changed if we adopt the expanding how many choices proposals. I would like to not rezone property in this neighborhood uh, until we see how things are going to work out. Uh, not only are we considering the most significant changes to the zoning code that have occurred since 2006 when we adopted the UDO, we are also considering now changes to the NPO, which we just adopted to make the NPO conform to the expanding housing choices thing. So there's so much up in the air. I would like to leave the current zoning boundaries in this neighborhood alone. Uh, noting that this property owner, Mr. McFarling, can still have two dwelling units uh, on that vacant lot, and he would wind up with four dwelling units on the two lots in the current RU5 zone. He could have his existing uh, non-conforming duplex, which is allowed there by law, and he could have a uh, single-family home and a sizable accessory dwelling unit either attached or detached from that home on the other lot. And that could keep his rental income flow going. It could provide housing for himself and for his aging father uh, on into the future. That's my understanding Mr. McFarling intends to run with the land in this case. Uh, and so given that so much is up in the air and the, the neighborhood has been through so much in the last uh, 15 months to two years over zoning considerations, I would like to leave the principal zoning boundaries in the neighborhood alone until everything gets settled and we see how things are functioning. To have one more uh, aspect of 
dynamism uh, going on in terms of the land use uh, uh, in the area and the regulatory environment seems to me an imposition on the neighborhood. And quite frankly, it's very hard for me to figure out what to expect. And what zoning is about, especially for people who have invested in their homes, not only their money, but their lives, uh, reasonable expectations is what zoning is supposed to supply. Uh, and right now, it's very hard to know what the expectations will be and what's reasonable and what's not reasonable. And I think these folks in this neighborhood deserve a break. So I'll be voting against this one. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Uh, Commissioner Gibbs and then Commissioner Williams. <clears throat> I'm going to support this. Uh, I was afraid this was going to come up. Uh, since the NPO was instituted, uh, and I, I knew it would, but I didn't expect it so soon. Uh, there is a need right now with this uh, property owner, and it's not going to be a skyscraper that's being built or a, a giant multi-story uh, house. Uh, I think what is being proposed uh, is reasonable. Uh, and I, well, I agree with a lot of the comments uh, so far and even <clears throat> the comments prior to uh, my speaking. Uh, there, there is something to it, but it's, if you wait for things to happen and all the bugs worked out with the NPOs and the proposed zoning changes and, and all of that, we all might be gone. Uh, and I know this uh, Mr. McFarling would like to get something done as soon as possible. Uh, and I, I don't think it's an unreasonable use of this particular lot in this area. That there are more duplexes around and I, as a homeboy, he used to live there and will continue to. I think he has the community at heart. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I'm going to support this and I, I'll, that's all, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Williams? I would like, uh, excuse me, technical difficulties. I would like to review the uh, drawing that you brought in um, I guess that's an elevation of the proposed property. Do you, do you mind coming to the microphone just for folks at home? Thank you. This drawing was done as a speculative thing before I even went and talked to planning and zoning, thinking that possibly if I could get a footprint that would fit within the setbacks of that single vacant lot right now, and before the NPO got passed, the height limit, I think, was like 31 feet or something. But after talking to planning and zoning folks, um, and y'all might help me here a little bit, something about the proposed land use in that area could only be a uh, minimum four acres or something was mentioned. And I didn't really have enough land there to do a fourplex on the vacant lot. I would have had to tear the duplex down and put the fourplex right in the middle of the two lots. And so this, this is a piece of trash, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does that answer your question? It does. Um, and in reference to my statement of um, accomplishment, as far as Commissioner Miller has spoken, I definitely agree with you um, in terms of where we're going and how we go about achieving growth. And it's definitely more than one way to skin a cat. And if you can accomplish the same goal without minimizing it, well, with minimizing the impact on the current neighborhood, its aesthetics, and those around it, then I don't see why it can't be accomplished without saying, no, you can't use the property, but we've had many cases before us previously where we have had issues with changing the zoning for a particular area within the same neighborhood and why that should or should not be allowed. And I don't think that we're harming density by creating a single family dwelling with an um, accessory dwelling behind it that could be used for its own purposes, if not building on both lots and doing so, if we're willing to demolish the existing to accomplish it, then we could do that and just start with the clean slate and still have 
two single family dwellings with two accessory dwelling units, give or take, if the lot allows. But I definitely am voting against this. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Williams. I will note Commissioner Baker has joined us. Good to have you here. Uh, any other questions, comments, or discussion from the commissioners on this particular item? Yeah, I had one question for Mr. McFarling. Um, just as a just a point of interest, you mentioned uh, be, you know because of the concern about the transient nature in the neighborhood. Uh, do you do leases or month to months with these units themselves? Uh, no, sir. For the past thirty years, I started out with a minimum one year's lease. Uh, normally, the leases automatically go to month to month. After that, I allow the tenants to re-sign longer term leases if they'd like to. Uh, most of my tenants have stayed with the month-to-month -month version, and most of them, I mean, I've had tenants for six, eight, nine years on a month-to-month -month lease after the first year ran out. So, um, no, I mean, I, like I said, I, I try to stay away from the transient uh, uh, rental-type situation. Uh, I did used to do Section 8 rentals in that location, and that was one of the reasons I got out of it. Okay. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Dr. Miller, so I'm just curious uh, among my colleagues uh, and taking into account comments made by Commissioner Miller in particular. So if the, one of the goals, that, uh, generally speaking, for Durham is to address the need for more for housing, affordable housing in particular, and we'll assume, we'll, assuming that this is a potential for affordable, more affordable housing, the notion of not granting this request but utilizing the existing zoning to still support more density with a single family resident uh, residency and then a, a accessory dwelling at, to accomplish the, the goal of what the applicant says that he desires to uh, eventually move back in, uh, have a place for his father and potentially him to move back, but then have an opportunity to still have rental income by offering an accessory dwelling. And I understand there may be a cost additional costs associated with that. But I'm just curious as does any of anyone of you have any thoughts on like you're accomplishing the, the goals that have been stated while addressing some of the concerns that the opposition has stated? I'll be, I'll be interested in hearing any, any feedback that you all have on. So if, if anyone has any feedback to be recognized, Commissioner Miller? So one of my concerns is, and this is borne out by the information the staff gave us at our meeting in November, um, for years, as the staff chart shows, as a matter of fact, I have it with me if anybody wants to be reminded, what's, our affordable housing in Durham is, is on the ground. Uh, what's built new is, is not affordable, uh, unless it's subsidized or you've got some charity behind it. Essentially, what the market supplies is not affordable. And right now, at least with purchased units, ownership units, that differential is be, span is between 300 and 350 is the uh, average price for newly built units in 2017 versus $200,000 is the average price for pre-existing units. I don't think there is any line that can be drawn between newly built or newly created density and affordability. I believe that's uh, it could happen, but it could happen without uh, any changes to the zoning code. I don't think we can relax the zoning code into affordability. That's just not going to happen. It never has and it won't ever. It's not the way the housing market works. Um, do we need units? Yes, but can we have units another way without affecting neighborhood character? My concern is, is I don't see it necessary to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I believe that the, what zoning does best when it is applied best is it makes good places for people to live. I do not want to throw this aspect of what we can accomplish with zoning away in order to build any new units anywhere. And in this instance, I think containing the RU52 district inside the Old West Durham neighborhood to its current boundaries is a better way to go in terms of preserving neighborhood character, which is what the NPO was all about and why we voted for it, um, uh, without necessarily sacrificing uh, the ability to obtain density uh, in this area 
in accordance with the NPR. I remind you, only in Old West Durham can you have an ADU of 800 square feet. Everywhere else, it cannot be bigger than 30% of the principal structure. Now, I suppose if you have a great big house in, in maybe an R10 zone or something like that, you might get one bigger. Uh, but in Old West Durham, the average house size is much smaller. Here we could build an 800 square foot ADU. It could even be attached to the, the new single family home. It's essentially a duplex. Um, and so why change the zoning? And upset well-established and long-standing uh, zoning and regulatory boundaries in this neighborhood. Um, and threaten its character. Because if we, if we pass this one, then it becomes the basis for the next person who wants to rezone his property to RU52. I want stable zoning boundaries. And I want neighbors, especially in residential areas, these are the people who, you know, we don't zone with these people anymore. We zone to them, we zone over them. Their ability to participate in the process that we're doing now is extremely difficult. We have alienated them with complications. And I mean, this code, this whole code thing is so complicated. Those of us who work on it all the time as citizens uh, have trouble with it. Let's leave this zoning boundary alone. If this property owner wants the income from two residential dwelling units on this vacant lot and the rental income that he enjoys from the two rental units in the existing duplex, he can have that without changing the zoning. I have always viewed a zone change as an extraordinary request by a citizen to change the rules that affect everybody in that citizen's favor. I think we should only do this when it's for the public good. And I don't necessarily see an overwhelming public good for changing the rules for the benefit of one property owner in this case, when the current rules allow that property owner to have essentially the things he says he wants to have um, and can have. So in this instance, we can, we can provide for the opponents what they want while the applicant still gets what he wants. Everybody leaves with a full bag. Why change the zoning? I don't see a good, strong reason for it. And I've also thrown out other reasons that concern me yeah, especially for the Old West Durham area, which is a, an area that has been facing enormous development pressures. Uh, I would like to see things settled there for a little while and see how it works. We don't even know how the MPO works. I have some misgivings about some of the limits we set in the MPO. And I'm concerned if we adopt the expanding housing choices proposals that we're going to talk some about tonight, uh, that we will just have a mess, especially in Old West Durham. Um, I think we need to take this into digestible bites, and I don't. This is not something that we must do as a matter of sound public policy. So, therefore, I'm against it, and I encourage my fellow commission members to vote against it. Commissioner Johnson, any additional questions or comments? Well, I was hoping for some feedback from someone other than Mr. Miller, <laughs> but um, if there are none, I guess. I didn't get what I was hoping to get, but I have enough information to make a decision. If if it's helpful, I I hear the concerns of the residents. I'm I'm inclined to vote for this. I think the what I've heard from Commissioner Al Turk and Commissioner Bryan resonate with me, and I believe that uh, it it is challenged. While I, I like the argument of it does make sense to get settled, and and uh, I respect Commissioner Miller's perspective on this. I also do have concerns about how long it takes to get every train moving in this process. And so I, I also don't want us to slow down uh, proposals that I think have merit. So I'm inclined to vote for tonight's proposal, even though I do, I do understand the concerns that have been raised. Uh, Commissioner Bryan. Uh, if you're ready, I'll make a motion. I believe we're ready, thank you. I move that we send case Z1800026 forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. I second, second that. I moved by Commissioner Bryan, seconded by Commissioner Miller. Before, uh, I think we're good then. We will have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Alturk. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. No. Commissioner Baker. Abstain. Commissioner Bryan? Yes. 
apologize, but just wanted to remind everyone, even though you don't vote and you're president, your vote would still count in the affirmative. We had that earlier with another case, just making sure. Okay. And, and just so folks understand, I think uh, Commissioner Baker's intent is having arrived after the public hearing process, choosing to abstain since he wasn't here for the whole conversation, uh, is something that commissioners do do over time. Except for that he's not abstaining. His vote still counts as a yes. Uh, where are we on the roll call vote? Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Hyman? Yes. Chair Busby? Yes. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Ketchin? No. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? No. Motion passes uh, nine, 9 to 4. This motion passes 9 to 4. I want to thank you all for your time. And a reminder, this will then move to the City Council. Uh, we, as, as commissioners, write our comments down, and those go to the council as well. But we certainly encourage you to make sure that you are able to come to the city council meeting where the final vote will take place, and there'll be a public hearing at that time as well. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, we're going to move to our final zoning map change item this evening, and this is case Z18-0020. This is Panther Creek, and this is a change to a text commitment only. As we get the staff report, I do just want to remind commissioners to make sure you speak into your microphone. We've been told it's sometimes hard for folks to hear us during our deliberations. If your mic isn't working, then we wish you luck. Ms. Struthers? Good evening. Uh, Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. I will now be presenting case Z18-00020, Panther Creek. And these are revisions to text commitments. The applicant is Donald Sever. This 161.162 acre site is located at 2708 2 Burton Road. This site is in the city's jurisdiction. The city council previously approved a zoning map change and a development plan on August 7, 2002. That's legacy case P01-74. This request is to revise text commitments associated with that plan. The site is shown in red. Earlier phases of Panther Creek have been developed to the northwest. The site is currently zoned planned development residential with a development plan, PDR 1.690, and located in the suburban tier. The development plan stipulated a maximum of 272 dwelling units, and that was for the overall Panther Creek, um, which extends to the north as well. The applicant is requesting some minor revisions to the text commitments. The first is to remove the 50-foot transitional use area. This TUA is no longer an ordinance requirement for PDRs. Additionally, the applicant proposes to remove notes 10 and 11 and modify note 12 related to Bragg Road and Mannix Road. Connections to Bragg Road and Mannix Road are not required to meet external access standards. To address connectivity resulting from revised notes, a text commitment has been added, limiting the number of units to 90 units east of Ardsley Drive until a second access is provided in the area east of Ardsley Drive. No changes are being proposed to the rest of the, the approved development plan. For the uni Unified Development Ordinance, any revisions to committed elements are considered a significant change and require a new hearing and recommendation from the Planning Commission prior to the case being considered by City Council. The proposed changes, as noted, have been reviewed by staff and determined to be consistent with the UDO requirements. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances. Staff is available for any questions. Thank you. We will open the public hearing on this item. We have one individual signed up in favor, four individuals signed up against, and we will allow 10 minutes per each side. We'll start with 
Those in favor, so that's Don Sever. Mr. Chairman, Commission members, my name is Don Sever. I'm with Summit Design, and I wish everybody a Happy New Year. Um, we do have two items that we wanted to address. One is the roadway connections. Um, with the original text, comment, text amendment, it was showing a connection to Bragg Road. And when we were looking at the, pro the project in more thorough evaluation, there's a significant environmental feature, a stream buffer that would be within this area. And we would like to eliminate that requirement to connect Bragg Road for that particular reason. And do you mind just speaking a little closer into the microphone? I think we're having a hard time hearing you. Is this any better? Yes. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, what I was mentioning was with Bragg Road, there's a significant environmental feature, that being the stream. And what we wanted to do was to eliminate the commitment to make this particular connection for environmental purposes. On the east side of Mannix Road, um, we will also prefer not to limit ourselves to connect into Mannix Road but as staff had put in their particular recommendation that we would like to do a, a commitment that for a maximum number of units to nine units <clears throat> east of Ardsley Road that we will make a second connection. Um, but we just want to give us the flexibility of make this connection where we would best be able to deal with it with the adjacent property owners. Um, we, if we make a connection to Mannix Road, there is no existing right-of-way dedicated to connect from this property to the new property. So we're looking at the, you know, just the possibility of moving it to a different location if we can find a, an adequate solution. The second issue that we're talking about is the 50-foot buffers that are along the perimeter. This particular parcel has roughly, well, it's, the overall development is limited to a 24% maximum impervious area. And our preliminary plans are showing that as we fully develop all the lots in the roadway, that the maximum impervious area that we're accounting for is, is roughly 16%. There's significant wetlands. There's a significant, a large number of, or large area for the 100-year floodplain that we have to avoid. With the main entrance coming off of Burton Road, the 50-foot transition buffer is limited on where we can put the lots in the roadway and stay out of the environmental features, that being the 100-foot 100, 100 stream buffer as well as the 100-year floodplain. By eliminating or reducing the 50-foot buffer to what's required by the UDO, it'll just give us more flexibility to properly locate those lots along the frontage. There's also the concern that as we this particular parcel is all downstream of the adjacent parcels being along Ardsley and along Mannix. The original commitment was talking about a 50-foot undisturbed buffer. And what we would like to do is to get rid of that requirement so that we know that we're going to have to deal with some off-site drainage issues, some storm drainage issues, and allowing us to come up with some flexibility of encroaching in that 50-foot area will allow us to properly address all the concerns for the future property owners. These were our major, major concerns, and that addresses everything that I have at this particular time. Thank you very much. And as I mentioned, we have four individuals who are signed up to speak against and we'll give you a total of 10 minutes between the four of you. Uh, Paul Glenn, Edward Freeman, John Parrish, and Christy Farrell. So if you can come up to the microphone and again, introduce yourself, give us your name and your address, and collectively you have 10 minutes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I live at 2612 Burton Road. I'd like to talk to you about the schools to start with. 
I've called and contacted all of them. There's not one available space for a child. Uh, it's Glen, Oak Grove, a charter school on Red Mill, and the one on Wake Forest Highway, which also has Oak Grove. This one's a little farther out. I think it's a middle school. So there's, there's not one place there. Next big problem is going to be traffic. I live five-tenths of a mile from Gear Street. The day when I left my house running 40 miles an hour, I met 25 cars from there to Gear. So, and if you if you build 90 houses and they have two houses per, the house beside me has four cars. And most people now have kids, you're gonna have cars too. So, but I do want to let the, everybody know I did call the state and the state mailed me a letter. 12, 3 of 18, and it won't, this is not the 18 study. This is the 17 study. They don't do them every year. The 17 study, they said on Cheek Road was 4,400 cars. Turns off for Cheek. On Gear Street, that's 5,000 cars. I'm not a beautiful mathematician, but that's 9,400 cars a day in 17, not 18. So this needs to be addressed for the study of kids, schools, and traffic. I thank you for your time. Thank you. So uh, for the record, sir, I, you may have given us your name and I may have missed it. Uh, you're Mr. Green, is that correct? Glenn. Mr. Glenn. Oh, Glenn, I'm sorry, Mr. Glenn, yes, thank you. Uh, we have Edward Freeman next. Good evening. My name is Edward Freeman. I'm in pretty much agreement with Mr. Glenn. I've lived in this area for 45 years, and I've seen some changes in the traffic, uh, let alone what it's going to do to the school system. I totally oppose any zone change in this area for that reason, and the traffic. Thank you. Great, thank you. John Parrish? Yes. George. Good afternoon, commissioners, or good night now, I guess it is. My name is John Parrish. I'm 2704 Burton Road. I'm adjacent to their property. I'd like to talk about the 50-foot buffer that they want to eliminate, I'd like to see that stay in place. Uh, originally, it's a 50-foot undisturbed buffer, and um, let me give you a little bit of history on this. We've been working on this property, and we have no problem with the people building the houses. They can go in there and build all the houses they want. But we went over this here in uh, 2002. We've been working on this property since uh, 1999, and now it's come back again to you guys to see if you'll move it to the city council to take a few of the benefits away. And with, with the amount of traffic that they're gonna have in here with this 272 houses, if it don't, if it stays at 272, I'm thinking it's gonna be a little more than 272. I talked to the developer tonight, first time I got a chance to talk to him, and uh, he's telling me he's gonna try to build maybe five houses to an acre. Uh, 8,000 square foot lots. And uh, he does have a lot of wetlands in there and he's got to put his, he's got to put his houses somewhere and we do understand that. But we'd like to see some uh, a, a way for the uh, automobiles to come out of that property besides coming to Burton Road and uh, Archley Drive. We'd like to see some go back up to Redwood Road, which originally it was supposed to go to Bragg Road and Mannix Road but now these guys say they can't do that because it's a creek up there. So I don't know what's changed from 2002 until today, but something has changed that they can't use those two roads anymore to go to Redwood Road. Now, Redwood Road has a direct access to I-85. I so it's, it's great access in and out. And uh, that's the two things, I guess, that's... Uh, concerns most people is the amount of traffic that's going to be coming out. I'd like to remind you, too, on when it's real stormy weather, that uh, Burton Road floods at Panther Creek. 
I've walked in that uh, Burton Road down that water up to my waist during the, one of the storms. But it does flood. Now, I don't know if the developer needs to put in larger pipes under Burton Road. Does he need to put in a bridge at Burton Road? He's going to have to put in a turn lane for sure right there next to my property. He's going to have to take part of my property to put in a turn lane. And I have no problem with that. But as long as they don't take too much of it. Uh, but he's, he's definitely got some stuff to do. But I'd like to see something done about that water. And he's, he spoke the truth. There's a lot of wet lands back in there, and there's very few places that they can build. But they do need uh, access to Redwood Road, and they don't need to build 90 houses before they get access to a second outlet. They, uh, they want to build 90 houses and then get a second access out. I think they need to get that no more than 50 or 60, but I'd like for you guys to uh, tell me what you think. Uh, he wants to build 90 houses and then, and then look for an outlet. I'd like for the outlet to be pointed out before he starts doing anything, and then when, after he builds 50 or 60 houses, have the road ready for a second out access out to Redwood Road. Um, he told me that he needs this 50-foot buffer for drainage. Now, I don't know how, how water can drain better on cleared land than it can on uh, populated land where it's got trees and bushes on it. So I don't look like to me it would drain better if it had something in there to stop the flow, uh, such as trees and bushes and all. But you guys will have to tell me. And um, I guess that's about all I need to ask you tonight. Um, anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Parrish. Thank you, uh, Mr. Miller, come out and investigated the, this uh, piece of property. I thank, I'd like to thank him for coming out. And I'd like to thank you, commissioners, for staying here hearing us out tonight. Good to see you, George. Thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, finally, we have Christy Farrell. Hey, good evening. I'm Christy Farrell. I live at 2519 Arsley Drive. And we are completely against this. Um, <clears throat> our road is already like a drag strip. So opening up Arsley Drive for an access to these homes is going to promote so much more traffic. Um, like I said, when you've got people, <clears throat> excuse me, when they had Redwood Road cut, um, closed down for the bridge, everybody was cutting through Arsley. Um, we've got a daughter. There's several families that are here that have got children that you can't even let them go out and play and ride their bikes or walk for safety because you've got people running 45, 50 miles an hour down our street. So, um, you know, like I said, we're against this because you open it up, that's more traffic, you've got more homes, you've got more people, you've got more cars. And, you know, there's no way of slowing the traffic down. We've had the sheriff out there monitoring and we've, we've spoke to police officers and the state trooper on our road and no one's done anything about it. We've tried speed bumps. So opening it up, and allowing these houses in and all this traffic coming through Arsley, Burton, and being the only access is just going to promote a lot more traffic and safety issues for our children, for us, for, for our, the elderly community, backing in and out of their driveway. So that's about all I have to say. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Ms. Farrell. Yes, you have uh, about a minute and a half. That's, that's plenty of time to holler, y'all. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, they did a study in 2015, and right now, every year, Falls Lake is closed. I don't know if anybody knows that or not. And I went there and skied for 20 years till I got too old. But now, maybe I'll get my youth back, I hope. But long story short, they blame it on the duck. In my year of skiing there for 20 years, it won't. But it did do a study in 2015, and they got a letter grade of C for Panther Creek. High fecal, ever what this is, I'm not a scientist, C-O-L-I-F-O-R-M, oliform bacteria levels. So I'm sure it's not ducks up Panther Creek that feeds into that lake. So, But they are closing the swim area every year, and they show it on TV if y'all have been there to see it. Thank you again.
Y'all have a good evening. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So at this point, we're going to close the public hearing. I'll look to the commissioners for any questions, comments, discussion, and we'll start on my left this time. Uh, Brian, do you want to give, sorry, uh, do you want to give the applicant some time or since he only took half yeah, you, you, 10 you, minutes, yeah. I, I wasn't sure since we did that for the last case. Um, he says he's good, so okay. thank okay. you. Though. That's always, always good. Uh, Commissioner Hornbuckle? I just for the developer, sir, I, I'm a retired sheriff's deputy and I patrolled that area for many years. And as that gentleman stated, I've had to wade through water down there in that, in, in that bottom near indoor lane down in there, putting up closure signs when, uh, when, it, when it floods. That's a floodplain down in there. I, I just don't see any way possible that to, to and, and, and wanting to remove this, the, the, uh, the, the, the barrier there, uh, the natural barrier there, that, to make a to make an entrance in there, I, that there would have if if I was going to develop that property, I definitely think I would find a way to do it off of Mannix Road. I, I think it would be much more beneficial to the neighborhood, the Arsley Drive area, uh, that that whole section. As the gentleman stated, it, it's a direct uh, Redwood Road. It goes directly to I-85. It would take a lot off of that neighborhood, and and Burton Road is Burton Road, Gear Street, Cheek Road. Is very congested down in there now. But my main concern is I just do not see uh, putting an entrance anywhere, you know, near that floodplain down in there. It's just, it's, 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 it's a, that's a disaster. To me, it's a disaster waiting to happen in there. Amen. Right. So we, we do ask that we uh, have rules of decorum at the public hearings. So you can always just give a thumbs up if you. Appreciate the comments. There you go. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Hornbuckle. Commissioner Miller? So I have several questions for the staff to make sure I understand. We have a development plan that was adopted in 2002, which is and it shows lots, but I'm assuming the, the lots shown on this development plan are not committed because of the age of the development plan and that the rules were subsequently changed to require graphic commitments to graphic presentations to be commitments. Is that correct? You are correct that the era of this development plan was illustrative. And um, so he could shift the lots around. But what doesn't change is the overall dwelling units per acre <coughs> figure of 1.69. Correct. That stays the same. And the housing type is a commitment, single family detached dwellings. Correct. All right, good. Just wanted to make sure I understood. Help me understand connectivity rules here uh, as they apply in the UDO running backwards to a 2002 development. <clears throat> right now, this property shows uh, connections with, see if I get them all, Burton, Bragg, Ardsley, and those are the only adjoining rights of way. Do the do our connectivity rules in the UDO require them to connect to those places where public rights of way run up to and join their property? So right now, I'm just looking at the development plan and I've got a little version of it, so I'm not sure I'm seeing it exactly as I should. So Burton, I'm working from east to west. Burton. Join, the property joins at Burton. The property joins at Bragg. There's a right of way. I drove down there. It's a neighborhood, and those lots run right on down. The pavement stops up a, maybe, I don't know, 200 feet short of the property line, but the right of way runs right down to the property. So for um, connectivity to adjacent stub outs. Um, right, exactly. Yes. So the Environmental features can be determined at site plan that a um, connect, connection is not required due to those existing conditions. Um, connections to Ardsley um, are shown on the development plan and would be required as the, I believe there's a stub out there. Um, and there's then, a stub out at Ardsley and you're yeah. saying that would be required. Yes. And then there is a stub at Bragg and that's required unless they, they're let off the hook at site plan because of an environmental feature. Correct. And right. so that's where this is coming in with the environmental feature. So we're cooking with gas. And then we come over to Mannix, and there's no stub out at Mannix. Mannix runs near the property, but unless they own, say, lot V or some other lot that connects with the stub they're creating, 
they don't have to connect there. That is correct. Except for the development plan contemplates a connection in there somewhere according to how many units they build. Currently, they're required to do things separate and apart from what the UDO expects. Correct. And it's relief from those requirements that they're now seeking. Yes, the previously approved development plan showed uh, connections beyond what the ordinance requires. Right, and then there is a way over here, uh, there is a connection that comes out and adjoins a, a piece of property to, to which there is no right of way. That's way over on the, on the eastern side. So what they're asking for today, to currently under the current rules, they have promised, depending upon the number, of, the schedule of units that are built in certain areas, to connect to, well, here, you tell me. How, how, what is it oh, that they're <laughs> currently required to do? So under the current development plan or under the proposed revision? Current development plan. Under the current development plan, they are required to connect to, um, based off of the text commitments that are shown, that's what's required the um, Mannix as well as the Bragg. Um, and then the Burton is shown on the development plan. Um, and Ardsley as well with that uh, that stub connection. So they they have to they're going to have a connection at Burton, and then they build a certain number of units, and then they have to connect to Bragg. So the um, the proposed text commitment of no the no 90, no the okay. current current requirements is all I'm trying oh, to. Oh yes, settle. the um, just the units are so because it doesn't actually name names; it just talks about connections. Off in, a, in an area, and I'm trying to make the named name, I'm trying to put names to the connections. Sure. Are you referring to the uh, um, text commitment proposed to be deleted, number 10? A maximum of 60 building permits will be issued. I'm not, I'm not referring to any proposed text Correct. commitment. Correct. It's proposed to be removed. It's text com existing text commitment number 10. Okay. Um, maximum of 60 building permits will be issued in neighborhoods C and B and until a Bragg Road or Mannix Road connection is opened. Right. Um, so, and then there's a certain number of more. Ultimately, if they build it according to what the current promise is, how many connections off the property must they, will they eventually have at build out? Three? Burton, I'm Mannix, counting. and Bragg? Uh, as well as Ardsley. Oh, four. all right. So th is it four or th is it? If they if they have Burton and Ardsley, do they have to have Bragg and Mannix or Bragg or Mannix? Uh, let's see. Bragg and Ardsley Drive will be extended um, to connect to the proposed roads in the site. So I'm reading it as both. All right, thank you. Now, at, but what they would like to have is just two connections. Correct. And that would, the two connections would be Burton and Ardsley. Yes, and that would be um, two connections up to 90 units. After 90 units, they would need an additional connection um, to the east of Ardsley. And that would be Bragg or Mannix? Uh, potentially. Um, all right. Thank you. Those are my questions for, I think they are. Let me, I wrote a bunch down. Let me make sure I've covered them all. All right. If, if I can, Mr. Chairman, I have a couple of comments. You may. One of my concerns here is, is that I drove all over the place out there. Uh, Mannix Road is not much of a road. I don't want to insult anybody who lives on Mannix Road, but it's a narrow little road. Uh, and it's not meant to be a carrier of a lot of traffic. It's meant to serve the houses that are on it. Uh, Bragg is better, but not much. Um, at least it's a bigger right-of-way. Uh, at least as I, as I look at the map and experience, it looks like Mannix is a tiny right-of-way. Bragg at least is a full-size public street right-of-way, 60-foot right-of-way. My biggest concern about, and I think it's important for us to note, this developer has the zoning he needs to build this project. He has rights connected with it and obligations connected with it. He must connect, he has the right to connect to Burton. Whether we like it or not, he has the right to do it. He must connect to Ardsley under the code, and there's no way out of that because there's not a, I suppose, 
And unless we argue that somehow the UDO provision with regard to environmental features uh, ha having to do with Panther Creek might eliminate that. I don't know how that would work. My biggest concern is, is ultimately the way in and out of this project uh, as it is proposed is requires a re this, everybody to ride along this little section. That's about six lots worth of, of, of this road running along Panther Creek. It's not named, but it would be an extension of Bragg. Um, and if it floods down there, then everybody is trapped until we have these easterly connections. Um, if we connect at Bragg, though, it, people can come out through Bragg and don't have to run down through that little road that runs in right next to Panther Creek. Uh, we don't have a lot of options here. We cannot set, we cannot close uh, off a right to a, a, high, a highway connection that the developer obtained when he got the property rezoned back in 2002. We can only deal with the request in front of us. I personally am not satisfied with this. Um, I think that the more connections that this environmentally impacted property has to allow people to find a way out of this that does not require them to connect at Burton or to, or to run along that little section of road that inside the development that would connect to Ardsley to Burton uh, is desirable. And so under the current requirements, uh, which would be three or four connections at build out, uh, which would include Bragg and include Mannix, I think that, in my opinion, is better than doing away with that. Uh, I also am concerned about the 50-foot buffer. Uh, I would feel better about a, I might vote for something that adjusted the use of the property that's now designated uh, transitional use area or this 50-foot buffer if they showed us exactly where, what parts of the buffer they wanted to use rather than just throw the whole thing out. Um, and my reason for that is, even though we don't require it any longer, is that when this was rezoned in 2002, we created expectations for the neighboring property owners with regard to a buffer. Uh, so that's over and above just zoning ordinance requirements. These are, this, these are reasonable expectations among the existing neighbors and new neighbors. And I don't want to just throw those out in whole cloth. If there is some way we can use that land to, and we can show it on a new development plan, how it makes some other issue connected to this development of this property better, then let's talk about that specifically. But I don't want to just throw out the whole thing. So I'm going to be voting no here. I believe there should be as many, as many connections uh, in and out of this property as necessary to relieve the burden that must occur if the, if the principal connections are Ardsley and Burton and they flow down to a road that I believe will flood. I just don't, I, I believe that's the only way to do it. I believe there must be a connection at Burton. The code requires us to have a connection at Ardsley and there's no way out of it. However, I wish you didn't have to do that. Uh, <laughs> But ultimately, I think the current arrangement is better. I would, if the developer wanted to withdraw this and come up with something a little bit more specific about how we might use the 50-foot buffer area, especially down near this Burton tail of the property, to make connectivity better, uh, then I'd be interested in that. And, and if we could make that road down there a better road for everybody, less prone to flooding, better for the creek, then I could see using the buffer area for that and reorganizing the lots down there. Uh, but without that specificity, I, I think this development plan is, is better the way it is than the way it's proposed. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we have Commissioner Johnson next and then Commissioner Baker. Thank you. Quick question uh, to uh, the applicant. Uh, I'm just curious as to the request to change the number of units that could be built before a second access point, uh, the 90 units. What's the basis of, uh, of determining 90 units versus 100 or 40? Or That's in the UDO. It's a requirement for UDO. It's 90 lots. 
Yeah. Okay, so none of them. Um, and am I correct in what I heard and what I'm reading is that uh, in that scenario where a situation where you would, you would build 90 units, the second access point is not identified at this particular point in time? That's correct. Because okay. what we're looking for was the flexibility of putting it at an appropriate location. You know, because we, like I mentioned, on Mannix, there's no right of way that goes there. So we would have to deal with some adjacent property owners, you know, to buy them out or get a 50 foot right of way, you know, to make that connection. Or if, if you wanted to just say that we had to still do the same thing with Bragg Street, we would still have to get into it, negotiate to get the right of way. Mm -hmm. Or if those two options to, would work, we might have to do, a, you know, a third one to connect onto adjacent property that would take it a much longer distance, you know, not connect into Mannix Road, but, you know, to go a, a further distance to connect into another street. But we're just looking for the flexibility of saying, um, let us work it out in the details. We will make the commitment for that second connection. Thank you. And for staff, uh, to follow up, yeah. uh, I'm just curious, uh, so a student of history. What happened from 2002 until January the 3rd, 2018 that, that led to the, well, I'm making this up. Was at the time that the, the 2002 uh, rezoning was approved, were the road connections that were proffered required or was that above and beyond what was required at that point in time? My understanding is that the requirement at that time, um, what was proposed was above and beyond the requirement at that time. Gotcha. Um, and so my, just my final thoughts is that, um, uh, once again, uh, Commissioner Miller in his verbose um, response made a lot of good points. One that would concern me was the, the removal of the, the buffer in that it set expectations for neighboring and adjacent uh, neighbors and, and residents. And so just throwing that away kind of goes against the whole purpose of putting that in place in the, in, the, in the first place. And secondly, without knowing where that second, uh, where that in some time in the future uh, additional access point kind of goes against the whole, like as someone in the development space, like certainty is like, there's a cost to uncertainty. And so I think that it just creates like a, some uncertainty, not just to the developer, I mean, what if someone doesn't want to sell that property or you can't get it? Like, are you just stuck at the 90 units and that may put your project tank it, you know, versus now and on the flip side, you have neighbors and residents who just don't know where an access point is going to come and maybe they don't like where you want to put it and they have to deal with it or take it or leave it. And so that just doesn't, it could be, if we want to make a change, I would want something much more suited up. Uh, in regards to knowing what was coming uh, to, with the changes. And so with that, I'm inclined to not support the request uh, because I just think what's, exist, what's in place right now with the existing rezoning back in 2002 works better than what's being asked tonight. So. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Baker? Um, I'd echo a lot of the comments of uh, my colleagues, um, Commissioner Miller and Commissioner Johnson. Um, some of their concerns are uh, my concerns as well. Um, I do want to um, say that I appreciate um, some of the comments that you made about um, trying to make an effort to uh, conserve um, some, some open space, um, sort of your concerns about the environment, and that was one of the motivations for not wanting to have that extra connection. Um, I certainly think that there are a lot of um, reasons why that would be in the public interest, but I also think that it's in the public interest to make sure that we have a connected street network um, connected network of right-of-ways. And so I, I, I do think that that is um, something that's very important to be considering um, in this. And so uh, I just I did want to clarify something, and this is a question for staff. Um, were this to be approved, connectivity would be reduced, the number of connections would be reduced under a full build-out of the neighborhood? So connectivity would still be required to meet um, ordinance standards of links and nodes for subdivisions. Um, You're talking about the 1.2 connectivity index? Um, I don't have that number memorized. Okay, okay. Um, but the, the external access is what's being uh, modified with that text commitment of the 90 units. Um, so that's uh, 
ingress and egress as opposed to connectivity. Okay, but Does that answer your question. Uh, I'm just curious, as it is now, before the change, mm -hmm. requires more connectivity than were this to be approved. To uh, external uh, access points, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I can't support anything that would reduce connectivity. I, I think that's really important. We don't have enough connectivity in our in our neighborhoods. Um, so um, again, I'd like to echo just um, some of the things that were described by um, Commissioner Johnson and, and uh, Commissioner Miller. Thank you. Any other additional questions, comments, discussion? Commissioner Alturk? Thank you, Chair. Um, just a question to the applicant. Have you met with the neighbors about this, about these changes? Um, prior to the meeting, we just met with one of the neighbors. Okay. We spoke, and a week ago, I had another phone conversation with another individual who lives at the end of Ardsley Road. Mr. Okay. Booth. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I really appreciate the uh, comments by Mr. Parrish, I think. Yes. Um, I just thought that you, you brought up a lot of good points, and it, it sounded to me like you weren't necessarily opposed, and I don't think, you know, my, my assumption is other neighbors are not necessarily opposed to the development, but they, they want to see it done in a, in a, in a, uh, in a way, again, that, ec that echoes some of the concerns that have been raised up here about access. Um, you know, I, I think that there are a couple of things that could be modified here that would, that, that would still make this development possible and that would appease some of the concerns of the neighbors. Uh, but I think as it stands now, I, I agree with my uh, fellow commissioners that there's just the, this, uh, these issues that, um, that make me hesitant to support it. Um, but I, but I, I think it's probably just a couple of things here and there that, that hopefully could move this forward. Um, so uh, I'm inclined to, to vote against it as well. Thank you. Seeing no additional questions, comments, or discussion, a motion is appropriate at this time. I move, I move that we send the case Z1800020 to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Uh, moved by Commissioner Alturk, seconded by Commissioner Johnson. That is the appropriate motion to go to the City Council, and so we'll have a roll call vote. Commissioner Alturk? No. Commissioner Johnson? No. Commissioner Baker? No. Commissioner Bryan? No. Commissioner Durkin? No. Commissioner Hyman? No. Mayor Busby? No. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Ketchen? No. Commissioner Hornbuckle? No. Commissioner Morgan? No. Commissioner Gibbs? No. And Commissioner Williams? No. Motion fails 13 to 0. Thank you, everyone. Again, a reminder, we are an advisory board only, so this will continue to the city council. They will see our comments. They will see our vote. But do stay engaged. This, they are the final determinant on this issue. So uh, there will be a public comment period. There'll be discussion. There'll be a vote at city council. I hope you all stay engaged in this process. But thank you all for your time. So we will move on to our final two items. And again, just a reminder, these are information items only tonight. So there will be no public hearing on these items tonight. They will be back in front of us at a future meeting, and there will be public comment period at that time. So we, our first item is Z180030 and T180009. This is the Patterson Place Design District. And we'll start with the staff report. Good evening. Um, I'm Lisa Miller with the Planning Department. Uh, I'm here this evening to provide you with an informational presentation to provide some background uh, on a pretty sizable project that will be coming forward to you scheduled for your February Planning Commission meeting for public hearing. Um, so we're hoping to be able to give you some background on the project this evening, hear some of your questions and uh, either address those this evening or make sure that those are addressed in our uh, public hearing presentation and memo for your February uh, meeting. So 
Uh, some of you may be familiar with this project. This is the Patterson Place Design District um, project. Uh, just very briefly, I'm going to focus on a back, the background kind of leading up to this project starting, um, then talk through the public input process uh, for this project, um, and then provide an overview of design district concepts. This is uh, one of several design districts and future design districts as well. So kind of making sure you all have a, a good understanding of the framework we're using. Um, and then briefly touch on two kind of issue areas that are specific to Patterson Place. Um, and the presentation at the actual public hearing will go into much more detail about what the proposed changes are and, and how those are different from our existing design districts. Uh, so just quickly, uh, the Patterson Place Design District project um, is to, the uh, objective of the project is to establish a form-based zoning district, which is what our design districts are, um, in the Patterson Place compact neighborhood. Um, as most of you are aware, we've got various development tiers. Um, the compact neighborhoods are those that are intended to transition to mixed use, walkable, uh, higher density and intensity areas uh, supported by transit. So there's two actions to put uh, this project in place. The first is a text amendment to create the regulations that then would be applied through a zoning map change uh, to the actual compact neighborhood tier. Uh, so for those of you, uh, so as I mentioned, the compact neighborhood tier system was created with our 2005 comprehensive plan. Um, the policies in the comprehensive plan talk about transitioning the zoning within those compact neighborhood tiers to design districts, there's a whole host of policies that support that. Um, the first design district was established in the downtown development tier in 2010, um, which we established the framework that we use for other design districts at that time. Um, and then we established another type of design district, which is the compact design district in the Knight Street area that was adopted in 2012. Uh, we then, in early 2015, uh, the planning department worked on a, with a fairly extensive public process to revise the compact neighborhood tier boundaries. Um, since the time that the comprehensive plan was adopted in 2005, there had been some changes, uh, both in terms of sort of future uh, transit uh, proposals um, and also kind of envisioning uh, the suburban transit areas that were previously designated. So there is a, a few changes that were part of that. One was transitioning transit, suburban transit areas to compact neighborhood tiers that were along the proposed Durham Orange Light Rail transit line. We revised the compact neighborhood tier boundaries in some locations um, and designated the future land use within those compact neighborhood tiers as designed to indicate uh, that they should become design district zoned. Um, and then there are some minor changes to the comprehensive plan policies, including codifying the affordable housing uh, resolution that had been adopted by our elected officials um, and uh, some language around the intensity statements for the subdistricts. Those proposed changes uh, were approved in June and August of 2016 by our elected officials. Uh, so in shortly following that, in October of 2016, we started work on this project, which Patterson Place, uh, the compact neighborhood tier there was the first uh, where we decided to start working on uh, implementation of our next design district. Um, so our first meeting in October of 2016 was really a lot of the same content that I'll be talking about a little bit later in the presentation with kind of an overview of our design district framework. What are the different components that make up the um, design district and how does that impact uh, what gets developed? Um, solicitation of feedback from the folks who showed up about applying that particular framework in the Patterson Place area, uh, and then no noting what are some areas of concern specific to that particular compact neighborhood tier. Uh, we then, in June of the, the next year, 2017, um, we kind of had a work session uh, where we asked folks to help us draw out how to improve connectivity throughout the compact neighborhood tier, um, where some uh, kind of defining sub-districts for folks in terms of the intensities that they're sort of defined around and asking folks to help give input on where those might be drawn, um, getting feedback about appropriate height and density using a visual preference survey mechanisms, 
Um, and then talking through uh, some environmental protections and kind of what was the most important aspects to protect. Uh, following that, in May of 2018, uh, we proposed uh, a variety of concepts for feedback. One were actual subdistrict boundaries. Um, another were proposed heights and densities. Um, we in included the affordable housing bonus that's part of the draft now for feedback at that time. Uh, a couple of different environmental protections. Um, a, a proposed future street network that includes additional roadway connections. Um, and some revised parking regulations that would help transition the area to a more um, multimodal friendly area. And then in October, this past October of 2018, um, we provided a presentation on the new subdistrict, or sorry, the new design district type that we had come up with, which is we're calling the compact suburban design district, which is what is proposed in the text amendment and for application in the Patterson Place compact neighborhood tier. Um, kind of went through how the ordinance works, how design districts work, how the design district article of the ordinance works with the other aspects of the, the other articles of the ordinance um, and provided full uh, text amendment language um, tied to sub-district boundaries uh, mapped out for feedback. Um, so the compact suburban design districts, um, this is a new type of design district that is intended to be applied to compact neighborhood tiers where the existing context is more auto-oriented. We have a handful of those, certainly the South Square and MLK um, compact neighborhood is one where we have that type of existing um, character that this would be appropriate for. So we we're th thinking about um, broader application of these standards when developing them. Um, for the most part, it follows the existing design district framework. It has sub-districts, um, prescribes uh, appropriate building placement, height and density, minimums and maximums, has frontage and building types that kind of prescribe how the building interacts with the streetscape and the public space, um, kind of basic design standards and good urban design principles, um, as well as some standards for breaking up uh, blocks into streets and alleys and pedestrian malls and, and providing streetscape amenities. Um, as I mentioned, it also includes an affordable housing bonus um, that I'll get into a little bit later. Um, provides for a transitional use area and some increased steep slope protections to get at the environmental protection concerns um, and a decent amount of parking requirement modifications to try and work towards removing parking minimums as a to allow the market to kind of respond more as the area transitions to not have, have our requirements kind of make things more auto-oriented. Um, so just briefly running through the design district concepts, the, the sub-districts you see from the graphic here, um, we've got the core on the right, um, the little transit graphic there. If, there's a, if these are along the station areas, then the station would be in the core. Um, then you have stepping down support one and support two, and then the surrounding residential. So the core areas around the station, the support two areas intended to transition to adjacent, usually single family residential neighborhoods, and then the support one is kind of the rest of the area. Um, so those uh, sub-districts have differences in terms of the minimum and maximum heights, uh, densities, and then in some cases, what permitted uses there are, particularly in the support two subdistrict, there are some more use restrictions. Um, we have a build to zone um, and generally no other minimum yards that are prescribed. So making uh, sure that the building is coming up to, a, to meet the street, to shape the space that you're in as, as you're walking along the sidewalk or the street. Um, the height parameters describe both a minimum and maximum podium height. So you'll see in the graphics here, there's sort of an initial building height and then it steps back and there's an additional height beyond that. That's the, well, that initial height is what we call the podium height. Then there's a requirement for a step back and then there's an overall height that you can reach after that. Um, and then there are both uh, minimum and maximum densities established. The minimum to try and ensure some residential to support the, the um, transit, um, and then maximums uh, to sort of 
make more predictable the, the maximum build out. Um, as I mentioned, the frontage and building types uh, really prescribe how the building interacts with the street itself. Um, the, fr the frontage types are really just kind of the face of the building that meets the street and doesn't really address uh, the sides and the rear of the building, whereas a um, building type, um, one of the example building types we have is a monumental building. So you think of something like the, the original courthouse building in downtown where there's more public space around it and it pulls back from the street. Um, so there's a, a type that allows that kind of uh, a setting. Um, but in general, the frontage types uh, prescribe a certain frequency of entrances, um, amount of windows to create more visibility and more activity along the street, um, and ways to uh, break up the overall mass of the building. And then there are some just sort of general design standards um, that are, again, intended to make uh, the buildings as you walk along more visually interesting to create more activity. Um, and uh, there are also some specific design requirements that apply to the monumental building type, and then also quite a few that apply to structured parking to try and minimize the um, view of parked cars. Uh, then the streets, uh, so we have, um, a future street network that is, uh, the map is included in your packet, and I've got a, a map here in a minute, um, showing as development occurs over time how we'd like to see greater connectivity of roadways. In addition to that, we've got adopted uh, street sections in the ordinance that are looking to create more multimodal streets where people can walk and bike and drive and have buses all functioning together. Um, we also have established uh, maximum block lengths and sizes in the ordinance as subdivision occurs um, and a requirement to create new rights of way um, as, again, as subdivision occurs to create smaller blocks and greater connectivity. Um, and then there's a, a handful of different kinds of streetscape amenities to make the, your walk along the sidewalk you know, shaded with trees and lighting and benches and trash receptacles and things. So I mentioned there are two, uh, two issues related to the compact suburban design district application in Patterson Place that I wanted to mention. Um, we, I imagine we'll go into these in more detail again in the public hearing. Um, so one of the things that we've incorporated into this is an affordable housing bonus. Um, when we have applied design districts previously, we have pretty significantly increased the densities and heights allowed. Um, in downtown, for instance, there are no maximum densities and the maximum height is 300 feet, but you can add additional height to that to unlimited. Um, so with this proposal, we are modestly raising by rate densi uh, densities and heights um, to what we have estimated to be the minimum density required to be transit supportive. Uh, some of you may recall we had a we were working with a consultant team uh, called Gateway Planning that was working on a, a transit-oriented development planning grant uh, in partnership with Go Triangle and Orange County and Chapel Hill and the Triangle J Council of Governments. And um, that consultant team has done transit-oriented development work all over the country. Um, and their guidance was uh, to ensure that the average um, density, minimum average density within a quarter mile of the station was 25 units per acre. It's definitely figuring out what a, a minimum transit supportive density is a little bit of a tricky question, but that was kind of our best guesstimate. Um, so we then would allow higher heights and uh, densities that are not limited by a maximum density, but only by building code and allowable building envelope um, if you use the affordable housing bonus. Um, which is essentially adopting the, the interim strategy uh, for this compact neighborhood, compact suburban neighborhood. Um, so, so there are some potential implications of this approach that we want to mention um, that could include impacts on ridership of the future transit line, um, the impact on uh, the mix of kind of residential and non-residential uses, um, and how park, uh, and then sort of 
how parking is managed in these areas are all gonna have an impact on whether the affordable housing bonus um, successfully uh, helps us reach our transit supportive goals. So one of the things that we've noted is that the bonus needs to be used in combination with other strategies in order to make sure that we're retaining existing naturally occurring affordable units um, and creating new units by putting funding towards that or using value capture techniques um, in order to make sure that that happens because the bonus alone is not something that we anticipate will fix the problem. Um, we also have committed to continu continuing to monitor the success of it in order to make sure that as we need to tweak how it's functioning that we can do that. Um, so just a, a couple of notes, there's 1100, uh, just almost 1,200 uh, multifamily and single family units that are currently in the compact neighborhood. Um, there's no legally binding affordable units, um, but of those units, there are naturally occurring affordability <clears throat> Um, to family incomes between 60 and 80 percent, that's 844 of those units, um, and, and 88 of those to below 60 percent of area median income. Um, so there is a real possibility for trying to look at preservation of the existing uh, naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, there's also been some other strategies discussed as potential options moving forward to to further assess, including tax increment financing, special assessment districts that could provide funding for either creation or preservation of units um, or providing grant funds to those utilizing the bonus in order to help offset the cost of, of providing those at a, a less uh, lower rent. Um, the other issue uh, that I wanted to briefly touch on uh, is related to the environmental protections for the area. For those of you who are not familiar, the New Hope Creek corridor runs along the eastern side of the compact neighborhood tier boundary. There's been a plan um, for preservation uh, of that corridor for decades in place. Um, and there's a group of folks that have been you know, working to help preserve that um, corridor for quite some time. So we've been working with folks trying to figure out what are some ways that the requirements can address some of the environmental protection concerns. The two things that we have in the current proposal, uh, one is a transitional use area that applies. If you can see, there's a yellow dotted line. Um, it's a little bit hard to make out on this map. Um, that would be the transitional use area where any development within that area would require a major special use permit um, with a handful of findings that are specific to that particular major special use permit. Um, it would include exemptions from existing development as long as the uh, building footprint or the area of disturbance isn't increased. Um, and the other thing that we're proposing uh, are increased steep slope requirements. The current requirements um, define steep slopes as 25% or greater, which we would modify, we're modifying to 15. It's a 5,000 square foot contiguous area for it to be protected, which we're having to 2,500. Um, there's currently a 15% disturbance area allowed, which we're removing. There are still some provisions for things like roadway connections that you're allowed to disturb for. Um, and there's currently a 15% of the area that you're allowed to count towards your density credits, where we're proposing that that be a full, whatever area is defined as steep slope can all count towards your density. Um, so just very briefly, um, as I mentioned, the uh, public hearing for this item is scheduled for your February meeting. Um, we then will be presenting both to the city council and the county commissioners an informational item. Um, and then to this project will go both to the city council for public hearing on both the text amendment and the zoning map change and to the county commissioners for the text amendment. Um, which we have tentatively scheduled or planned for April in order to kind of beat their um, budget cycle. But I am happy to answer questions about this. And as I mentioned, uh, we're happy to answer questions that we can or if there are things that we need to incorporate into the presentation at the public hearing, we can do that as well. Great. That is a lot of information. You yeah. spent a lot of time working on this. I know a lot of the, the planning, com planning department has, so thank you very much. And I think we'll just open it up to commissioners for questions or comments. So I'm sure we have some questions for you. Sure, great. Okay.
Commissioners? Commissioner Durkin? I just had a question about the enforceability of the affordable housing bonus. So if it was utilized, how would you then enforce that they're actually doing what the bonus would allow them to? Yeah, so that would require that, I think we've talked about annual um, checks to ensure that there is compliance with that, which is not something that we have in place yet, but would have to establish with, along with that, absolutely. Great, Commissioner Bryan. Thank you. Um, one thing that was mentioned in the memo that came to us prior to the December meeting uh, on the bottom of page three about a report by T.J. Cog that copies would be available at December. Yes. Uh, I would really like to be able to read that report. Is it possible to have copies brought to our meeting next Tuesday? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I actually, in anticipation of this question, uh, I sent out an email with a link to the document oh. for anybody that is uh, up for reading it electronically. Um, and then just let us know who wants copies so that we're not printing them if you're not going to use a printed copy, but we're happy to provide those. Okay, and just a, a brief comment uh, on the 200-foot uh, uh, transitional use area. Uh, again, based on what I read in your, your memo, I would come down in favor of the 300-foot buffer, but i will also be willing to allow some exemptions you know, for small intrusions, but I would like to know what the square footage of that intrusion, what the maximum would be uh, before I would agree to it. And also to just to display my ignorance, uh, is it likely that the property, just the land itself, uh, that is inside this tier, Will the value of that increase by virtue of being inside this tier? Well, so it's been inside the tier. Um, and so there may, there has definitely been some increased development interest in mm -hmm. this area over the past handful of years. Um, we would anticipate that um, as the light rail project continues to move forward in all of the areas near a station that the there will be continued development interest and increased development interest and would therefore probably have a, an impact on the value of property. Okay, where I'm going with this is that if the property gets more valuable and you build development on it, uh, potentially your property tax increases. And if your property tax increases, then affordability might go down. So. Yeah, so that's one of the ideas behind you know, using a synthetic TIF or some other value capture opportunity, which is um, the, the, the TOD planning grant that I mentioned earlier, a lot of that work was done to try and predict what the overall impact um, in potential value capture of increased tax revenue could be. Um, so I, I think... Now that that study has concluded, there will be much more discussion about what we use that information to do in order to figure out how we can make sure that the increased property value that comes along with a transit investment can provide community benefits that are things like affordable housing and um, in some places perhaps addressing infrastructure needs and things like that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bryan. Before I recognize Commissioner Baker, I did just want to point out the the TJ Cog report has the best title I've ever seen for what are ten <laughs> traditionally very dry reports. The footnote notes it's called Raising the Roof is the name of that report. Uh, it's definitely worth reading before our next meeting. Commissioner Baker. Um, so I'm incredibly excited about this. Um, I think that retrofitting suburbia is the challenge of our time. Um, you know, we, we have enormous challenges that we're facing as a society and as a city, um, you know, uh, when we think about things like climate change and, and um, you know, the, the cost of living, which is increasing for um, people all over this country, um, a lot of it has to do with the built environment and the way that we've been building our cities over the past 60 to 70 years is completely unsustainable. And so this is going absolutely in the right direction, and we need to be doing more of it. Um, and we're not going to get it perfect on the first time. You, you, you know, I, of course, we know that. Um, you know, there's going to be challenges, and it's it's ugly um, going through, and 
um, you know, trying to take this built environment and completely change the way that, that people interact with the, their environment, um, you know, driving, you know, uh, we, we've got driving rates of 97% or something like that right now and, and trying to see, you know, how, how can we dramatically change that. So, um, you know, work like this, and this is great work, work like this is so unbelievably important for the future of Durham. Um, I did want to just mention two things, uh, you know, um, nothing that'll be surprising to staff, but um, when we think about affordable housing, we're not going to solve affordable housing with a capital A, um, with a TIF, and we're not going to solve it with uh, inclusionary zoning. Of course, a lot of tools are not available to us in the state of North Carolina, um, you know, but we really need to, as a city, we need to come together and put our money where, where our mouth is, and we need to be able to um, spend money on true affordable housing, on true social housing. Um, so that's going to be really important um, looking forward. And the other thing is design, because frankly, we're not getting design right in a lot of the um, higher density development that we're doing, uh, even though it's mixed use and sometimes it's kind of nice. There, you know, I, I work across the country, we're seeing a lot of backlash to the types of kind of people call them stack and pack. You know, this, this mixed use development that's going on in uh, Chapel Hill and Durham and Charlotte and all over the country, um, people are kind of revolting against it. Um, and so I think a lot of it is not necessarily density as much as it is character and design and um, just kind of the enormous scale that we're seeing. And so I would just keep those two things in mind as you continue to move forward is that we really need to invest in true affordable housing where people who need affordable housing must be living, which is around transit. Uh, and then we need to be thinking about, well, how do we make the built environment, right? And you talked a lot about it. You talked about sort of the frontage and how does the pedestrian interact with the frontage of, of the buildings. And, you know, um, we, you know I, I like to think everyone's a planner. If you plop someone down um, somewhere, um, they'll, they'll say, yeah, I'm comfortable here. Or they'll say, you know, I, they're on the side of 15501. They're like, I don't know. I'm not very comfortable here. Um, and maybe they don't know all the different subtleties that make it um, a great place or don't make it a great place, um, you know, but I think that staff does. And so we, we need to make sure that we're doing design right because um, we need to create places that people feel comfortable in. So uh, I just want to applaud the work that you're doing um, and I'm excited about what comes. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Miller? So as I understand, we still are not going to require residential in this design district. So the way we incentivize it, but we don't require it. Uh, res residential, not affordability. That's your question. Yes. So the the current um, compact design standard requires that for a project over a certain size, I think it's two hundred thousand square feet, um, that you are required to include a residential component. Um, What's the requirement? Uh, so that's based on the sub-district, the minimum. Um, and the minimums range from 9 to 21 um, in the support to up to the core. Um, the, the issue that we uh, were concerned about was the com combination of that with the affordable housing bonus um, is that if we're requiring... Uh, if we're requiring residential in every project, um, we, as we're trying to make sure that any uh, side effects of putting the affordable housing bonus in place don't negatively impact the character kind of directly around the station where non-residential is generally more appropriate from a from a TOD planning perspective, people are more likely to walk further home than they are to get off the train and go to a job. Um, so a lot of it came from trying to work through making sure that we are offsetting potential suppression of uh, development intensity if people choose not to use the bonus. Um, but I welcome your comments. And so <clears throat> if did I read this correctly that in the uh, S2 sub district we will allow single family and duplex housing? 
So that was something that we incorporated into the compact suburban design yeah, district. That's for that the CSD districts only. Yes. So that, depending upon how Lee Village goes, it might appear there as well. Yep, and what we were thinking is that as long, that it essentially would be like a very flexible PDR, that you have to meet that minimum nine units per acre and support two, that it could be a way of creating some of the more uh, creative housing uh, types that people are kind of interested in doing that we're addressing some of in the Expanding Housing Choices Project and some of them were not but it would allow a lot of flexibility and really just focus on making sure that the minimum density requirements are met and the open space is provided. But we don't have a frontage type or anything that would obtain or require for those developments? Mm, no. I believe that's correct. I don't see how you could apply any of the frontage types to single family dwellings. Right, yeah. Um, are we fixing the frontage types? Because I have major my problem is, is that an ordinary person ought to be able to look at the frontage types as illustrated in the zoning code and then look at a building and say, that's the, and we can't do that. I can't do it, maybe you can, but I can't do it. Uh, and I don't think our design regulations are very effective. So I would, are the, are the design, the frontage types for this gonna be the same frontage types that we, that obtain in Ninth Street? Yeah. Uh, although very little of any development that has happened in Ninth Street was under this code. Was, Some of it has. Uh, there, yeah, I think two projects. Two, two yeah. great big projects. Yes, I understand. <laughs> and, and they're and, just as yeah. mysterious in their frontage types as the ones that are being built downtown. Yeah, one of, so one of the things that we have seen is that for, so both of those projects are residential, um, and for residential projects, people want to, they don't want to put a different use on the ground floor, and they, so they want to pull the building back further than the build to zone requires. When you say so, people, you're referring to the developers. Yes, the folks that are, or the folks that are designing the projects, working with developers, um, that's the, so they tend to use the forecourt uh, option, which allows you to pull further back um, from the street. So, with the compact suburban design district, because we're dealing with areas where there's already more room, um, like we don't have the same urban constraints that we have in a place like downtown or Ninth Street or Alston Avenue where there's more development in a very urban um, pattern already, um, trying to take some of the things that we were more constrained on and, and allow some greater flexibility to hopefully address some of those things. I want to follow up on something that Mr. Baker said, because I also uh, am getting a little concerned about the, what I believe is the overuse of, he called the stack and pack, I was calling it a Texas donut, but the, but the five stories wood frame on two stories concrete podium residential. Um, in the S1 subdistrict, would I be able to build four stories wood frame construction on one or two stories um, concrete podium under this proposal? Not without using the affordable housing bonus. Okay. And that well, was intentional. Well, good. Yeah. That's what I thought I was reading. I just wasn't sure. Uh, what can I build without taking advantage of the bonus? Uh, I believe it's 45 feet of height in, in the S1. S1. Let me just verify. Because that's yeah. currently the height limit in S2 in 9th Street. Yep. Do we 45 in S1 and 35 in S2. All right. Interesting. Um, Again, this is part of trying to figure out how to make the affordable housing bonus attractive. Used. Attractive, yeah. Um, um, yeah. What about in the core? So the core, as I mentioned, um, the... That is the area where we are most uh, interested in getting non-residential development. The core as drawn in these subdistricts is relatively constrained. Um, and the by right- is a smaller percentage of the whole. Yes. And the by right height in the core is 145 feet. Okay. Um, I still think it's too big. Uh, 
mainly because once we turn something core, we lose all control. Our hands are off. We, if we don't like what's happening, we can't fix it. Um, I would rather to start with a plan that says, this is the core we're gonna start with. This could be core under the right circumstances and then invite developers to ask for rezoning to core mm -hmm. and then we can look at their projects as we go. Uh, rather than just to say, here's the core and throw it all on the ground at the beginning. I would start with a small core, identify part of the S1 as potential core uh, in, our, in our planning document, but not, in, not make it law to begin with. That's just an idea. I would do the same thing with the S1. There is a section of this area that is, I guess, to the uh, northeast or east uh, that I think it should be S1. Right now we have that S1 box, I believe, a little around to the east and to the north. If, if in S2? fact, my map, if, if, my, if I've got my north and south. Do you mean uh, an expansion of a support two as opposed a to? Support two, I think, okay. I think this it. bulb here behind the Ford dealership should be S2 Got it. to begin with. I just, I, I do. And then my biggest concern, which has been the concern all along, is cons considering the fact that there is no pedestrian connectivity on the other side of 15501. I believe it should not be part of this design district. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be something else, but it, it's never going to communicate with, it's never going to, in my opinion, uh, promote the principles of, of design districts um, because it's never going, there's nothing we can do to make it pedestrian attractive. Um, on, on that note, I will mention because I was, uh, there was a lot of stuff to cover. I didn't mention the 15501 corridor study. Um, we actually, the, the impetus for, for restudying that area came out of the beginning of this project and it really was trying to figure out what are our options open to us that would be allowable through NCDOT to try and create better connectivity across that barrier. Um, and we're continuing to work with, with the, the folks, uh, staff and the consultant on that. Um, and a lot of, there haven't necessarily been a lot of creative ideas about uh, how changes to that corridor might take might look, um, but there has been a lot of focus um, by staff, both planning staff and transportation staff, um, at really focusing on the bike and pedestrian connectivity across 15501, um, and trying to incorporate that into a into a a greater connected street. I think you can make it possible. I don't think you can make it attractive. Mm. I do not think you can make a, a pedestrian facility that a pedestrian is going to want to walk on. He may do it if he has to, but not because he'll want to, because you're going to ask him to walk a long distance in a concrete environment that's just not very attractive, and it may actually be scary. Yeah, you got one. But that's, that's just me. Um, I think this is a lot better than what we did a number of years ago at Ninth Street. I would still like for us to make better. Um, we welcome your forms. comments if you have particular issues that you want to see addressed. Please, please feel free to pass those along. <clears throat> All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Commissioner Alturk. Thank you, um, Lisa. Thanks. This is a great. Uh, report. Thanks for the presentation. I, I, how, how popular are design districts across the country, and how long have they been around? Form-based districts. Uh, so, our design districts are kind of a hybrid form-based code, um, which we don't completely remove use from the equation. Um, we do kind of unify what uses are allowed in each of the subdistricts pretty broadly. Um, when. <laughs> Been in, they've been around for a couple decades. Okay, so they've yeah. been around for a while and they're yeah. probably all over the country, right? Mm -hmm. So do we have, I mean, I, I guess I want to follow up on Commissioner Bryan and Commissioner Baker's comments about affordability. It seems to me like we're trying to, right, we want to have these design districts, but we, and you've acknowledged that this might make things unaffordable or make, um, and so I guess I'm, I'm wondering, you know, do we have some something to base this, you know, this on, right? Can we look at other cities that have 
implemented design districts, something similar to ours, and to see what the effect on affordability has been. Yeah, I think it's hard to pull. Um, so there are a lot of factors that go into what is impacting affordability. Sure. And I think that it's hard to zero in just on putting zoning like this in place. Um, and I think it's also tough because um, so, you know, a transit investment is certainly something that's going to impact affordability. Um, but in order to make that transit investment successful, then we need to have uh, intensity to create ridership and to support that. Um, and, and in order to modify the transportation patterns in order to deal with congestion and the amount of growth that we're foreseeing. So um, the way that I would look at the design districts are they're trying to create a better form for greater intensity. We have existing zoning districts that in order to accommodate more growth, we could increase the intensity. Um, we would still have affordability issues, but we would not, the design district piece is really trying to look more at how uh, you can, uh, you know, creating more mix of uses and creating um, more intentional public spaces between developments. Um, so I think, I mean, certainly I, I feel fairly certain that I could find uh, some studies that have looked at affordability and uh, form-based code. Um, I'm not sure, I think there would be a lot of caveats to extrapolating that about whether or not it's a good idea to, you know, to implement a design district, for instance. Sure, sure, and, and, and there's no doubt about that. I, I guess what struck me about part of this report, and on page four, you mentioned the number of naturally occurring affordable units in this, and that, that you know, this seemed to me a relatively high number. It's a, a good number, 80%, fall within that range. Um, but, you know, it, it's, I think we're bound to, that number is bound to go down if we have these, dis, you know, and, and again, you're right. I mean, it's not just because we have these design districts, it's, you know, other factors are contributing. I guess my concern is that we have, are proposing these design districts and saying, well, there's, you know, there's one, we're proposing one tool, which is the, the affordable housing density bonus, right, uh, or bonus, which you've acknowledged is probably not going to do much, or then has not in the past. It's not, yeah, it's not gonna solve the problem. I, I guess, so then, the, so then why implement a design district without knowing, I mean, without waiting on or, or, or trying to address the affordable housing issue as well, simultaneously, because, I mean, in the report you say, well, some strategies that could address this in the future are X, Y, and Z. I, I don't know. I'm worried that we do something like this and then our, you know, this area becomes unaffordable. So a lot of, uh, an excellent point and question, absolutely. Um, and I think, so part of what we are trying to balance um, in our role is a whole host of outcomes that create a more livable city. Um, affordability is a big piece of that. Um, a, another very big piece of that is creating the intensity that we need to accommodate the growth that's occurring in places where they're concentrated and we can serve with transit, even you know if it's some other form of transit. Um, and so it's important that we start to shape our built environment in a way that's going to be supportive of creating places that people don't have to drive everywhere. Um, and that, that will have an impact on affordability in a positive sense. And so it's, it's <clears throat> There, there's a lot of um, coordination that's been happening uh, over the last couple of years um, with our department and the community development staff and working on affordable housing um, strategies in our department, working with water management and public works and looking at infrastructure. Um, there are a whole host of things that are sort of in the works trying to work towards those goals in these places, and this is one piece of that. So I, I'm not sure that that fully answers your question, but at least yeah, gives you some of our thought process. No, and I guess you know we're we're getting this report right before we get you know the the report on you know housing uh, 
expansion, whatever it's called, housing and housing change. Yes, um, and I guess what if if I'm not mistaken, I, I didn't see anything in there that you know that address. Most of that was about you know kind of the urban tier and and duplexes and and so. I don't know, there was nothing in there about some of the suburb, I mean, there was some about, that was, some of the things would address some of the housing issues in the suburban tier, and maybe in this particular sub-district, or you know, this design district, but it, I, I am worried about trying to go ahead with something that could have an effect on affordable housing before we address some of the affordable housing issues, uh, you know, holistically, so that, that's why, I mean, I guess that's why I started with the question about other cities and other, you know, I, and I, I get it, it's, you know, it's hard to extrapolate, but um, I think going in with more information or, you know, fuller information would be better with something like this. This, this is a big, you know, um, change, so. But, yeah, that's. I will, I don't see anyone else looking to make comments. Uh, we'll get to Commissioner Bryan in a moment. I, I'll make my remarks as well. Is someone else looking to make comments? <coughs> Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'll just say big picture, I really appreciate the work that went into this thing. It's very thoughtful. There's a lot of good things in here. In particular, I like the decision to just modestly raise the buy rate. I think that's a smart approach. I hope it works. I know we've got to see it, uh, but, I, but to make it enough to be transit supportive, I did want to just uh, agree with Commissioner Bryan with the concern on going from the 300 foot buffer to the 200 foot buffer. I, I don't think we're getting the balance right there that's needed from the environmental protections and the commitments that we've made from for many decades. So I hope that's something we, we look to revisit. That's the one of the big things that stands out to me as falling short of what I would like to see in this plan. But there's a lot of really good thought and, and really appreciate your presentation. So Commissioner Bryan, did you well, have? Let's look. Commissioner Commissioner Gibbs hasn't had a chance yet. I'm sorry, Commissioner Gibbs. Well, I, I won't take but just a minute. I, and I agree with what you just said. Uh, and uh, I can see where this whole uh, project is going. Uh, this design, this uh, Patterson Place, uh, do we call it a des design district? That's fine, yeah. There are several types of design districts. This is one of them. This would be one of them. This is suburban CSD. design. Yes, you can also district. call it a CSD if you like acronyms. Yeah, and uh, there are just an awful lot of things, details within this that I can't speak to because I have opinions and feelings, and with all the other things that we've all been involved in that are piecemeal to what makes this whole thing up. I'm going to have to study uh, this, uh, this presentation. <coughs> and I do appreciate the effort that has gone into it. Uh, <laughs> it ain't easy. And I, I realize that and that's why I'm not gonna make any comments plus or minus uh, th there's still a lot of things in my head that uh, about addressing it but I I am a big proponent of maintaining <coughs> the environmental impact uh, standards that are here uh, the rest of it is just going to be brick and mortar and how we're going to put it together, accept it, or whatever. Uh, anyway, I, I will end my comments there, uh, but I am going to use this as another Bible from the planning department. <laughs> so thank you so much. You're in the planning department. That, that seems like a good place to wrap up this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do have one final question, and then we're going to move on to the, the final item tonight. Is the staff looking at any scenarios where we actually don't get light rail? So we have discussed on many occasions over the last couple of years whether it makes sense to continue moving forward with this as there's uncertainty on that project. Um, and one of the things, uh, as far as potential projects that we could be working on that are in a compact neighborhood, this is one that is 
very accessible by roadways. Um, and so we think that even if the current light rail project doesn't happen, that this is a good place to create uh, this type of development setting. Um, we absolutely need to figure out a way to connect it to other places if that project doesn't happen, um, but are confident that that can happen given it's uh, the way that it's set in sort of I, I agree with you with regard to Patterson Place, but we actually have a string of pearls that right now are brightly shining from Chapel Hill to Durham and a little growing a little duller as we go towards Raleigh. Uh, and I am beginning to wonder, I'm beginning to think it may be prudent to start thinking about other growth patterns that are not based upon rail systems. It's based I do, upon what I've been reading in the newspaper. <laughs> I do think we, we have an Curtis opportunity with the <laughs> uh, upcoming comprehensive plan work that we're going to be doing uh, to be thinking through, uh, not necessarily instead of, but even and. Um, plan B. Yeah. Um, and, and we will be working on that in a timeline where there should be a decision on federal funding for the project, which will help us know how much of a plan B we need. Yeah, I mean, if we're committed to light rail, we have to go ahead with what we're doing. But I was just wondering, will we be ready if we don't get what we want? Mm -hmm. And Commissioner Bryan with the big finish. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, very quick, first of all, I'll just note that I've got a number of little picky things that I'll just send to you and you can Great. deal with them on I your own. Uh, but one thing I wanted to mention a uh, long time ago, when we were doing what was called the 2020 plan, where we were again looking at transit stations and stuff like that, a lot of attention was paid to what was going to be within a half a mile oh, of the station and what was going to be within a quarter of a mile. And part of the reason for that, I think the half mile was really considered to be that's the maximum distance somebody would really want to walk to catch the train if they had to do it you know, every day going to and from work or something like that. So if you're trying to, you may want to think, is there any way to get housing within a half a mile of your station? No. So there, the, the work that was done in looking at the compact neighborhood tier boundaries mm -hmm. used that half mile, which is considered a, a 15 minute walk mm -hmm. um, or 10 minute, I can't remember, 10 minute walk. Exactly. And the quarter mile is a five minute walk. <laughs> So it's essentially, uh, that's where we started and then we looked at what's on the ground and what are where actual parcel boundaries and things. So that was definitely part of the consideration at that time. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Commissioner Alturk? Yeah, just a quick pr procedural question. Um, has VPAC had a chance to comment on these um, we proposals? We just have not, I don't think we've had any uh, comment on them. On, there's not a lot changing in terms of the bicycle, right? there are a lot of bicycle parking and right. bike lane provisions in the street sections that are in the existing ordinance. Okay. There's not much that's changing related to that. Okay. And so. not much in terms of pedestrian issues as well? I guess. No. Okay. All right. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Ms. Miller. We'll see you in February. Our final item is uh, also information only. It's the expanding housing choice. Good evening. I'm Pat Young, director of the City County Planning Department. More importantly, I am a poor substitute for Hannah Jacobson, our senior planner, who along with Michael Stock, who I'll introduce in a moment, is a uh, key leader and uh, manager of this important project, Expanding Housing Choices, and appreciate you all's time tonight in allowing us to give you a update. I think what I want to emphasize uh, more than anything else is um, based on commitments we've made to city council and to the administration, we want to take this item forward to uh, council and to the Board of County Commissioners uh, by April or May. And so in order to do that, we want to bring this back to you for action on February 12th. But our commitment to you and to the community uh, is to work as hard as we have since uh, May and June of 
of 2018 uh, to get comments, to get feedback, to get input, uh, to answer your questions, and to listen to any concerns that you may have about this initiative so that we can reflect those and what we bring forward uh, on February 12th. So um, I want to talk a little bit about what we've done today. We, we've had um, Mike and Hannah have led this project in our uh, planning team. We've had over a dozen community meetings. We were at five Rock the Park events last um, summer. We met with uh, the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transmit. We met with the Inner Neighborhood Council. We're meeting on Monday night with the Watts Hill and Dale Neighborhood Association at the request. And we're meeting over the next several weeks with several other neighborhood associations who have met with us. So what we've done is we have a standing offer, uh, both we, that we try to push out through social media, conventional media, and through our website, that we will meet with any group at any time, as long as we have availability of staff. And we've met that, um, we've met that commitment. We did also have two open houses here uh, at the last week of November. You may have, uh, several of you attended, and thank you. Uh, you may have also seen the um, posters that have remained up uh, over the holiday season that provide all that information. And I think most importantly, and I say most importantly because we are able to track these metrics, uh, we have all the information we're presenting to you, uh, and that was presented in the open houses online. And um, we've, we've received uh, well over uh, many, many thousands of hits, and we had 1,300 folks participate in our online survey over the summer. So we feel like we've made a, a very strong effort and our best attempt to get robust community engagement. Uh, and now that we are moving towards um, bringing this item forward, we really want to emphasize that over the next month or so. And you all are among our most important stakeholders. So if it's not tonight, please reach out to myself, Michael Stock, or Scott Whiteman with any feedback you have. So one, uh, one area, maybe the only one, that, I, that I'm sure we can all agree on in this room is that uh, safe, affordable, and attainable housing uh, is the key characteristic of a community that is uh, healthy, diverse, vibrant, and most importantly, inclusive. That, um, that allows uh, a diversity of housing opportunities for folks at all uh, incomes and folks at all stages in their life and, um, and for the, to meet their choices and needs. And this project is focused uh, on that because we, uh, as you all are well aware, um, have- Mr. Young, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're, we're actually not seeing the presentation on our screens. I don't know if that's something that, that we can make sure can happen. That would be helpful for us. Yeah, we're seeing you, but we're not seeing that. Oh boy. There we go. Now we're seeing that. Okay. okay. Thank you, we're, that's great. Yeah, our apologies, some technical difficulties, and thanks, we, we do want you to have access. And this is available online, of course, but, and we'll share uh, this and some of the materials I'll refer to tonight with you all um, directly after this meeting. But uh, the Durham success, and what you're seeing in front of you now is, a, is a, uh, just a, a summary of recent accolades that Durham has received, um, top 10, top 20 lists, uh, Durham's success at attracting businesses and people from all over the country and all over the world uh, has paradoxically led to uh, increased competition for a limited supply uh, of housing. Um, and people are forced to make very difficult choices, sometimes impossible choices, when it comes to trying to uh, keep up with that competition and either retain their housing or, or find housing in Durham. Um, many of you know or have worked with Dr. Jim Johnson, who's a demographer at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, he talks about what he calls the migration dividend. And what that refers to is he's, he and his graduate students have done a lot of research on um, who's moving into Durham, from where they're moving into Durham. Um, what, he's in, what his research has shown is that of, as of 2015, the most recent year for which data is available, um, the average in-migrant, the, the person who moved to Durham, uh, brings over $10,000 in annual income than the average Durham resident. Uh, and that's their 17 people a day, approximately on average, um, six th over six, 3,000 people a year um, moving to Durham and um, 6,000 people a year moving to Durham. And um, that increased competition um, is the fundamental factor. That demand for housing is the fundamental factor in this project, this expanding housing choices project, and so many of the items that you all see before you. Um, but at the same time this demand is increasing, um, we're, we're seeing um, additional factors 
that are um, adding to the, the problems that are caused by the demand alone. More uh, jobs have been added, 29,000 jobs since 2010 um, in Durham than, than at any time uh, since the 1980s, uh, and more households formed than, than, were, uh, than housing units were created. Um, it, I know that it looks and feels like a housing boom, a construction boom, but we are on track, and that's good change in this year, uh, but we are on track at, through nine years of the decade uh, to produce less new housing units than any decade since the 1980s in Durham. There's a number of reasons for that. We could spend a whole other session on, on that, but um, we believe one of those reasons uh, are our, um, our rules and requirements for housing, and, and that's why we're doing this project. Um, so these factors together have increased competition, uh, has led to an impact on price. And I think more significantly, this, this shows the changes since 2013 um, that have gone up uh, from about 160,000 for an average unit to almost 260,000. These, this phenomenon is focused primarily on our urban tier in near, near town neighborhoods. Um, neighborhoods that are ring downtown and, and that are within about two miles of downtown. Um, that is for the reasons that are probably evident to all of you, many of you, which many of you live in these neighborhoods. Uh, access to jobs, access to amenities, access to transit, access to downtown entertainment um, options, grocery shopping, uh, and all the other things that make life great. Um, what you're seeing on the slide here is that the overall countywide increase in housing, existing housing prices from 2013 to 2018 was 44% which is enormous, but is only slightly over the national average for urban areas. Uh, but in our in-town uh, neighborhoods, particularly those that have been historically uh, communities of color, uh, medium or lower income, and have been stable neighborhoods like East Durham, um, those have been, you see the slide, th over 300%. And there's other neighborhoods, Walltown is very similar. Um, and then that we're starting to see those types of increases even farther out in, uh, in northeast central Durham, southwest central Durham, Bragtown, and other areas. So what that, what that refers to is the fact that um, there's incrementally higher demand from a lot of our new residents, but also existing residents, to move in closer to downtown. That's something you all have seen and heard about uh, and, and lived and experienced over the last, uh, certainly since the recession ended in 2010. Uh, and I think there's, you know, there's a complex web of theories, and there, the housing market, of course, is very complex, but, but we believe um, <clears throat> that there's a really important and pretty clear, obvious phenomenon that's happening here. A lot of folks are moving to Durham. A lot of Durham residents are trying to move closer to downtown. If housing doesn't exist at, at the price point that they can afford and at the housing type and location that they want, they will buy down the ladder. And what that means is they will look for opportunities in town neighborhoods that have been historically stable, historically communities of color, and historically uh, low and moderate income, and start the process of neighborhood change or gentrification. I think each of you has probably had a lived experience that alludes to that fact. Someone who may want to live in Mott's Hill or Trinity Park can't quite afford it. They go over to Cleveland Holloway and buy an old Victorian mansion for $200,000 that's now worth $600,000. That's just an example. That's happening 17 people a day, every day, for the past six years and for the past 25 years, that's what the state demographer is predict predicting. So that's 160,000 new people over the next, through 2045, so it's 26 years. That's about 60,000 housing units that our community's gonna have to produce. Really, that's a phenomenon that we have very little control over. That's what the market is demanding. Um, we can try to push those to Western Wake or Alamance or Granville but um, we believe in order to be an inclusive community, we need to accommodate those 60,000 new housing units. Um, we believe that it's important that a, a higher share of those be in the neighborhoods where the greatest demand uh, is clearly evident, and that was shown by those housing price increases since 2013. So um, what I wanna emphasize here is that um, increasing housing supply alone will not um, substantially help and certainly not solve the housing affordability crisis in Durham. I can't emphasize that enough. But another thing I want to emphasize, and I want you to please remember and, and question me or, or research it on your own or, or in, let's have a dialogue about it is we will never be able to significantly improve um, 
the housing affordability crisis without increasing supply. It's a critical component of the solution, along with uh, additional um, subsidized uh, grant programs and loan programs and other tools that help capital A, permanently affordable housing, along with a whole suite of other community interventions uh, that will help this issue. One of those pieces is allowing uh, supply to increase where the market is demanding it and where housing prices are reflecting the fact that there's a significant uh, mismatch between um, supply and demand. Another key point I want to make in this regard, and, and Commissioner Baker alluded to this in his comments, um, it is critical that we pair affordable housing opportunities with uh, access to public transit. And I think make getting that uh, housing as close as possible to our light rail, plan light rail system is, is critical. But something I think we've all observed, uh, even though the light rail is many years off, um, if, it, if, if it indeed happens at all, as Commissioner Miller alluded to, um, we are at some risk of that <coughs> in the case. Um, much of the housing that's near these transit areas is going to be extremely, extremely expensive. And it's going to be uh, likely to be developed, as you've seen now, by um, large corporations that are financed by Wall Street, Street or real estate investment trusts or other large um, investment entities. Uh, what we are focusing on in this initiative is allowing a small scale, um, gentle, uh, context sensitive, context appropriate development uh, that will not degrade, diminish, or destroy that outstanding quality of life we have in existing in town neighborhoods, uh, that, but that will allow significantly more opportunities um, for folks to have affordable by design housing. And that's what you hear, you've heard the term missing middle used a lot. We are not proposing triplexes, fourplexes, or small garden apartments with this initiative. Um, we may, we will investigate and evaluate that with a comprehensive plan. We were looking at duplexes and accessory dwelling units, and you'll hear um, much more detail from Mike Stock about that. But what we think is that these types of housing opportunities, unlike the large, um, I'm trying to remember the terms that Ms. Baker and, uh, Mr. Baker and Mr. Miller put on it, but the, the five-story on a podium, um, it's That's probably not, better that you don't use those terms. I, I, I really try my best to strip my vocabulary of disparaging terms for any development <laughs> um, at, at the risk of not offending anybody, because somebody lives in all of those things. Um, but um, th what this will, we think, will encourage is development that can be funded by neighbors, that existing homeowners can redevelop and age in place. Someone who's in their 40s or 50s who kids go to college um, can build... Uh, at an accessory dwelling unit or um, build a duplex and rent out one side and age in place and have a stream of income to do that. Um, essentially what it amounts to is locally financed, locally sourced community redevelopment. Um, we, a lot of communities are looking at this as a key part of the solution. You may have heard Minneapolis, Minnesota passed a comprehensive plan that allows this throughout the city. Uh, we're looking primarily in the urban tier. Um, or the state of Oregon is passing, a, is, is inter, there's been a inter, bill introduced in the legislature that would require communities to allow quadplexes uh, anywhere single family is allowed. We're not going there. I think we think that there's a nationwide trend that's seeing that this type of housing opportunity is critical. Um, most of the in-town neighborhoods that were developed prior to World War II, you see a lot of this housing type there. And I, I think the vast majority of neighbors in those communities feel like it fits in context. What we're looking at doing is trying to reestablish that, but making sure we don't damage or degrade or destroy the existing quality of these neighborhoods. So in summary, before I turn it over to Michael to talk about some of the detailed concepts, we want to vary the menu of housing types that are available, trying to get away from just single family or large multiplexes. We want to stabilize housing prices. As I tried to say earlier, we don't think this, will, this project will result in significant reductions in housing prices. What it will do is will allow um, us, our housing units, to keep pace with the, with population and job growth, and create in the process create more opportunities um, for folks to um, stay in their neighborhoods and to live in Durham. Um, you're going to hear a lot more about this from Michael, but uh, in addition to that buying down the ladder effect I talked about, a lot of our mission-based nonprofit builders like Habitat for Humanity and Casa already have lots of lots. In, uh, in town, uh, in the urban tier, 
and with the, this proposal using the affordable housing density bonus can go from one unit to say two duplexes. And that, that cumulatively will have a significant impact, we believe, on affordability. As I've tried to stress a couple times here, nothing we're proposing here in our estimation, and we want your feedback, would uh, destroy or degrade the character of these existing neighborhoods that are beautiful. They're gems, they're, they're the gems of Durham, and what we wanna do is enhance them and allow them to be more accessible for more people uh, over time and allow folks that are in these neighborhoods to, to stay in place and have opportunities to do um, locally sourced redevelopment. And have this kind of small scale creative infill that I've talked about, and finally, um, we wanna make sure that this can be done um, by right, through the rules that are passed through this process. Um, the, um, especially for small developers, as you all have heard from many applicants standing at this podium, um, the rezoning process or the use permit process imposes a significant cost uh, that is often not able to be borne for somebody who's trying to build an ADU in their backyard or, or go from a, a single family unit to a duplex. So I'm gonna turn it over to Michael to talk a little bit more about the uh, menu of zoning uh, proposal changes, and we'll be happy to take any questions you all have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Um, it's tough to follow that, and and <clears throat> who knows? We'll 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 see if I uh, do the job adequately enough. But what I just want to kind of briefly go over with you, and again, these are all uh, items that um, were discussed. Uh, at a more concept level throughout the summer and into the fall and presentations to the elected officials and then um, even uh, provided in more detail through the open house at the same presentation and the posters and what's online. Um, we're not, we're not uh, discussing anything that's, that's brand new. Um, there, there are just a number of, and if you looked at the presentation already or looked online, there are some just general topics that we're looking to uh, modify or add to. Uh, the first one are the infill standards. Um, as as uh, Pat alluded to, um, uh, context-sensitive development is, is still important, and the infill standards are, are standards that currently exist within, our, in, within the UDO. Um, we're not... Uh, what we're looking to do is modify them uh, to, in some cases, uh, uh, m make them clear or uh, make the rules uh, uh, more meaningful and, and enforceable. Um, and also, we'll, we will need look to modify them to make sure that they do not conflict with other provisions that we're proposing, um, such as the uh, smaller lot area or actually specifically lot width requirements. Um, these infill standards are primarily applicable within the urban tier for residential development, um, and they uh, act as almost like an overlay for uh, all residential development that's under four acres in size. So we wanna make sure that they um, uh, do not uh, create a uh, chain, uh, issues that create some of the changes that might be moot. Um, we also um, are looking to use them as ways to address some of the uh, impacts that um, uh, additional built environment could have, uh, such as tree canopy and such, and making the landscaping section a little bit more meaningful, borrowing from some of the standards developed for the Old West Durham neighborhood uh, uh, NPO. Accessory dwelling units. Um, uh, we've allowed them by right since 2006 when the UDO was adopted. Prior to that, they were required as a special use permit. Um, they still are not a prevalent development uh, uh, type of dwelling unit throughout Durham. Um, since 2006, I believe we took a look at it, around 70 or 80 so accessory dwelling units have been done. There's a lot of factors for that. Um, the fun there's very little financing uh, options for those right now, and that's something that we are actually working with to address in conjunction with this, with community development uh, department. Um, but also we are taking a look at the regulations to make uh, sure that we are we have regulations that can open up op more opportunities for accessory dwelling units um, uh, Taking a look at some of the limitations on the lots um, uh, uh, Streamlining the size requirements to just a flat uh, square footage requirement um, So you're not having to figure out your size of your house and compare it to um, uh, What size ADU you could you can have um, and um, um, also looking to expand the, uh, a little bit of location where they can go on the lot too, to uh, allow more flexibility. And um, also possibly expand them to duplex 
lots too, to uh, start introducing uh, an ADU on a lot that already has duplex. Currently, they're allowed on any lot that allows a single family unit. So single family housing or even townhouses houses can have an ADU uh, as part of it too. Duplexes. Um, quite frankly, uh, we are looking to expand duplex allowance by right throughout the residential districts in the urban tier. Um, and also expand their possibilities when you do a kind of specialized uh, cluster subdivisions and conservation subdivisions uh, in the suburban tier, uh, which they become more prevalent. And those are trade-offs where, if you're familiar with those, those are by right uh, types of subdivisions where you get a trade-off on smaller lot sizes um, or even an increase in density with conservation subdivisions with, a, with providing more open space or protected areas. We actually heard that from council when there was one conservation subdivision rezoning or tied to an existing conservation and questioning why they, they needed a rezoning when they're tying into a development that quite frankly only allowed single family and they wanted to do townhouses. So uh, duplexes, townhouses for, for um, conservation subdivisions. But we are looking to expand duplexes and start treating, and the theme throughout a number of these changes will be starting to treat duplexes, two, two unit dwelling units the same as a single family dwelling unit. Um, making them, uh, not making a duplex stand out more than what a single family house would be developed like. So treating the development standards the same. Uh, lot dimensions and density, um, as we've alluded, not alluded to, but discussed uh, quite specifically, trying to increase density within some of these uh, in, uh, in town neighborhoods and thus adjusting the lot sizes accordingly for by, uh, by right. And we've taken a look at the numbers that are currently on the books for zoning districts and use those as a basis for the changes. And as, you, as you've seen and hopefully you've seen in the documents and through the open houses, you've seen the, at least what we're proposing at this time um, to adjust them kind of down by one step. Um, uh, and then the density changes are really uh, to align the lot dimensional standards with the maximum densities allowed with the zoning districts and also taking a look at the future land use map and making sure those density maximums um, do not conflict with those future land use map designations. Um, and then finally, although there was one slide with this, uh, an, another, uh, actually a new kind of uh, housing type that is being proposed is the small house on small lot. And there's a couple things that are with this. So we heard a lot of comments or, or uh, interest in allowing people to do, there, there's no minimum, uh, the zoning does not require a minimum house size. Um, and there's been lots of interest in smaller houses. We're not talking about tiny houses that we've seen on HGTV that are on wheels and can be pulled all over the place. But we're talking about just smaller houses and that there's not a need for a larger lot for a smaller house. Um, so we have introduced a housing type that allows for a smaller lot size, um, probably around what we've proposed so far is around 2,000 square feet with a 25 foot lot width. Um, but in trade, you are capped at the size of the house that you can put on that lot. Which and, is? Hmm? Which is? Oh, um, 1,200 square feet with an 800 square foot footprint, is at least what the numbers are on proposed right now. Um, a second, uh, Part of that is a smaller flag lot option where you could reduce the flag uh, flag lot if you are, well, if I could best describe a flag lot is a lot that looks like a flag and it has a pole, which is a very small piece of land that, act, that fronts along the street and extends uh, back. And then there's a buildable area usually behind an existing lot. So the flag is the part is the buildable lot area and the pole usually functions as the access drive primarily. Um, they're allowed by right now, um, but they have to be, the poles have to be at least 20 feet wide. And we're looking to reduce those pole widths to 12 feet um, to, in um, to allow more flag lot possibilities. But again, you would be limited to the lot, to um, uh, the size of the house. And it actually functions as a homeowner, uh, property ownership opportunity that's very similar in design or, or scale to an ADU. So you, would, you, would, you can have an ADU to the rear of your house or you might have a smaller house on a separate lot, on a flag lot to the rear of your house. Um, 
So that, that's an option we're also proposing. Uh, other things that we, another option that we've mentioned briefly is the, the cottage court, um, or sometimes they're called pocket neighborhoods. Um, other jurisdictions are starting to develop these, and these require open space uh, and the development of housing units around the common open space. Um, I don't know if we'll be moving forward specifically with those at this time um, because of the, the need to set aside land just for open space. We're not quite sure these are appropriate for a uh, particular urban tier setting, um, but they would definitely will be explored um, uh, uh, through the comp plan and such. Uh, there are other um, additional changes that we've noted um, in the uh, uh, in the posters and online um, that I'll be glad to uh, uh, answer for you. Just wanted to give you the timeline. Uh, Pat discussed the timeline that we're working with. We are in the uh, kind of the second public engagement uh, process, fall 2018, and now we're also kind of but blending more into the developing the proposed draft. Um, we're going to take a look at the comments and the, and the feedback we received from the online survey. Uh, we'll, hope, we'll provide that to you at the public hearing uh, for your information. Um, and then uh, once uh, you've made your recommendation, we'll obviously schedule it for the elected bodies and we're shooting for April uh, or May at the latest. Um, and there you are. We'll be glad to answer any questions for you. Thank you, Mr. Stock and Mr. Young. Really appreciate the thorough presentation. Commissioners, questions or comments? Start to my right. Commissioner Bryan. Um, I'll start with a trick question. Um, in the documentation that you presented uh, with respect to duplexes, you asked people if they could recognize a duplex and you gave four things to pick from. 82% of the people you asked got it wrong. Uh, your next question was whether or not people would be comfortable having a duplex in their neighborhood. And I think 60-some percent were comfortable and another 20-some percent were fairly comfortable, something like that. And it sort of generated the question, in my mind, if people can't recognize a duplex when they see it, how are they going to know if they're going to be comfortable with it in their neighborhood? Well, that's the whole point, is that a lot of folks are concerned about the design and aesthetics and how duplexes stand out in a neighborhood, and it just points to the fact that people um, generally, unless they can really study the house and see two specific doors with mailboxes, that they're going to no not notice the difference between a, a single-family house and a duplex house. Okay. Um, no. Sure. I add one. I'm sorry, Commissioner sure. Bryan. I just want to quickly add one piece to that. I, I think everybody's probably aware of this, but I want to make sure I get it on the record. There is a law in North Carolina that prohibits us from uh, regulating the appearance of one and two family no, I, units. I understand. And I, I, think you're, I think you're aware of it, but I do want to make sure that's on the record. So, again, any um, design characteristics that may be objectionable for a duplex would be just as likely, if not more likely, to be found in a single family unit. Mm -hmm. So, just to emphasize the point Mr. Stock's making. Yeah. Thank you. Second question, um, as I currently understand it, the only, I guess, adopted policy statement or a policy wish maybe is for affordable housing 15% in the areas around, the design areas around the transit stations. What in these proposals contributes to getting affordable housing there, if anything? Well, this is a focus around primarily the urban tier, which there are some, the, the transit stations have their own designation, which are the compact neighborhood yeah. tiers. So this is not likely to help in the compact neighborhood tier. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Well, we, we recognize that there's a variety of different development opportunities and options that we're going to have to provide. Um, we briefly discussed it on one of the slides that you, that Durham's going to have to take a look at. There's some building out, mm -hmm. which we currently see in your typical suburban subdivision development toward mm -hmm. the edges, and that's becoming, uh, even that is starting to become uh, more and more expensive as land is 
just generally becoming more and more expensive and the challenge is um, there's no easy land out there to develop now. There's lots of uh, environmental challenges, particularly with that land. Or building up, which is taking a look at the, usually generally around downtown or your compact neighborhood tiers and then taking a look at uh, what aspects of building in can we, can we accomplish. Okay. I do have one final question. There's still, believe it or not, land available in South Durham. Uh, if you're not careful, or what is likely to happen based on some of the developers I've talked with is that if they can get it from the owners, they, they want to put townhouses there. Townhouses seem to be the thing of the moment right now. Is there any way that this, these changes can maybe help people do something different make things in this land that's available more affordable? I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a tough question to answer. I mean, land is just going, becoming more and more expensive, just quite frankly. And townhouses are, are popular because A, you can provide more units based upon the land that you're paying for, um, and it's built under the residential code. So single family townhouses and duplexes are all under the same code. Once you get to quads and, and even small apartments, you're under commercial code and you're hitting uh, a host of additional regulatory uh, requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bryan. Commissioner Miller? So one of the things that I would like to understand is the, excuse me, Patrick, you might want to step around so I can see you. Uh, the, um, so we're, if I understand the current plan for applicability of this, it's going to be um, everything in the urban tier except for RS-20. And the biggest RS-20 district I know of in the urban tier is in Forest Hills. Can you explain why we're exempting that? Well, there was no intent to exempt that neighborhood. What the intent was was to have it apply uh, to the urban to tier into the urban the residential urban RU zoning districts, some of which are in the suburban tier. The vast majority are in the urban tier. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Bryan asked a, a very good question about policy. But guidance. but we well, also have a lot of RS zones in the urban tier, and we're applying to those it to those. So RS eight, RS ten. We have that in the, the urban tier, and we are applying these to that, but not to RS-20, where we actually have the most unused land. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I understand this correctly, would what would be the maximum ADU in, in, in RS-20? If this was passing. Well, the, the ADU provisions would have... So would, a, would apply to any residential okay, unit so it's, anywhere. It's not, it's, all right. that, that's not limited. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it, one, as I tried to emphasize in my comments, we wanted to make sure that these proposals were in context and incremental. And RS-20 is a much lower uh, density zoning district, and we were concerned that full application of all of these uh, provisions, we did allude to the fact that the ADU standards and, and several others would apply in RS-20, but to apply all these standards would be potentially out of context. Reasonable people would get, can disagree. Want any comments you want to give us on that, what we want to talk No, about. I just wanted to know what the rationale was. I'm not, I'm not arguing. Sure. Um, so I also want to understand the RS, I mean, excuse me, strike that, the, the ADU location proposal. Uh, one of my biggest concerns based upon the Old West Durham experience is the, in a neighborhood where the lots are 50 by 150 or 50 by 100 or smaller, somebody builds a gigantic ADU in the backyard, well, a gigantic, let's say an 800 foot ADU in the backyard of the house next door, uh, it can dominate uh, the backyard privacy of the house, houses on either side. Um, and it looks like you're trying to address that by requiring ADUs to be at closer to the principal residence, but I'm not sure I understood what you were saying on, well, I think you're calling the poster for that. Can you explain it for me so I understand it better? Um, the biggest change with the locational requirements, right now they're required to be to the rear of the primary structure. What we're proposing is to, 
allow some possibility to the side of the primary structure. And, and it would really only the, work. To the side, do you mean around, literally, to the side? To the side of it. Um, so um, many of you have seen garage, uh, detached garages that are to a side of a, of a house but aren't attached to it. Um, so we're looking to um, uh, make that allowance apply to ADUs. To the, generally, what we're proposing is to the, either the back half or the back quarter of the house, so it's not right up front with the primary structure. And so I, it still that's the has part a, I didn't understand. What is the back half of the back? Well, so if you walk down the side of the house, you have oh, the front half and the back half. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, yeah, I'm with you. And we're struggling. We're, when, we, when we bring the text with you, we're, we're struggling with the appropriate wording for that, too. So, But that's generally the idea. Because my own preference with ADUs is, is that they be up closer to the structure to which they to which they accessorize, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and so that backyards are freer, mm -hmm. uh, because I believe that's what neighbors object to. Mm -hmm. I also, in the same thing, saw that we're requiring a tree, but I don't understand. I, I, I'm troubled by the tree requirement because it appears to be window dressing to me. If we wind up with a situation where on a small lot you can have a duplex and an ADU and you're also going to require a tree in the backyard, you're not going to have much space for it. Um, I mean, I'm not sure I understand it. What if the tree dies? You're going to go in and cite somebody for a zoning violation? Well, I mean, that is, yeah. So um, the, the tree requirement is actually uh, uh, stolen. Yeah, I understand. Borrowed from the old West Durham. And I'm, and not, and I'm not making fun well, of the so concern. I'm concerned about the, the, about what the tree the, requirement does. How we can make it work. So what the tree requirement does, it does a couple things. A, it helps uh, address uh, a potential loss of tree canopy, which if you're going to allow for more development anywhere, you're going to be losing trees, whether it's even a suburban tier, rural tier, wherever. Um, uh, you'll be seeing actually a compendium, uh, well, not a compendium, but a separate zoning text amendment, which uh, brings more um, tree coverage requirements and such uh, uh, next month also. Um, but um, uh, what it also does is start to uh, uh, minimize or prevent additional impervious surface. So if you have to have a tree um, or show either retain a tree or plant one, you start to at least mandate a little bit uh, uh, less impervious surface. That's coupled also with the driveway requirements of minimizing the width of the driveway. So there's a couple yeah, things. The driveway there. requirement was empirical and made sense. Uh, the tr I was having t trouble understanding how, how the tree thing was going to the work. The tree was just actually a simple, uh, but we thought effective way of starting to get more, introduce more tree canopy in a very uh, easy way of doing it. That's that's very understandable to uh, anybody who's looking to just build a house or an ADU or, or something um, that you just. But this tree is going tree. to be. We talk about tree canopy, so this tree's got to be a canopy tree. Um, that tree canopy we're talking about it doesn't have to be actually. We're going to say it's either an understory or canopy tree because we also realize that there are uh, different uh, planting and planting area requirements and, and viabilities for health. Um, also understand that we have current street tree requirements that are required on, on um, uh, private property. Uh, so those are also currently uh, uh, reviewed and enforced. So. Really, it's just um, adding an additional checkbox to see if there's a tree there, whether it was maintained or planted. And then the infill standard thing, if I understand it correctly, today, uh, the infill standard's based upon the concept of a block face, which was problematic from the day it was written into the code. We have blocks in Watts Hillendale, but what's a block in a Hope Valley Street? I could not tell you. Um, the and it basically says, if I understand it correctly, an infill house in there has to be relate in some way to the average heights or somehow of the houses on the block face. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you have more than 25 foot separation from the nearest dwellings, you can add 14 feet to that average figure as long as you don't max out the 35 feet requirement. Is that right? That's the current? No, it kind of works a little bit differently, and that's well, why we're it, actually changing it. Um, you're held to either the, the zoning height or whichever is lesser, the zoning height or 
um, at most 14 feet. But that 25 foot you're talking about is actually exempting that 14 foot um, cap, per se. So we're, we're clarifying how and what structures right. you measure, you compare the height to. But there's a 35 really foot exempt. requirement no matter what. There's a 35 foot requirement that from the base zoning district and it right. recognizes that, but it also requires you what would be the lesser. So if the lesser is what is So if, we, is if it's a neighborhood of one of one story houses and under the current rules you can't build anything substantially larger than a one story house unless you've got 25 foot separation is that not right? No, you can get you can you can add it it allows for an additional uh not additional story, the 14 feet gives you an additional story. Well, it's really not a standard at all then with a 35 foot cap because the average single family resident, unless it's got a flat roof, is about 18 to 22 feet. So you add 14 foot, you're saving a foot or two. Is the, it seems to me this is just wasted paper in the code. Well, we can take a look at it. That's definitely a comment that we'd like to hear from. Because uh, I don't think our infill standards are actually standards. Uh, if, if Jeff Monsignor, not to it could build what he was building in Old West Durham that caused so much alarm there under the existing infill standards so that we had to create an NPO for them. It seems to me that our, in, our, our infill standards were not serving us very well. That's my observation, you don't have to respond. I wasn't going to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's, I would like to have because part of your presentation, Patrick, is, is that we want to protect the character of neighborhoods, and we're going to do that with these infill standards, but I don't think we have any infill standards. We have an infill standard that affects height that we're actually talking about making, uh, relaxing, uh, and it, but it's only a couple of, it's only a couple of feet off what the maximum is anyway. It's, it's more of an irritant than a character protection, and I'm again, I'm all for protecting character, I'm against having zoning regulations whose purpose or whose, whose effect is merely to irritate people. Well, if, if I might respond in this way, I appreciate your point. We do take the need to protect context very seriously. We're also concerned, candidly, as I think you've heard from us previously, that you know an individual neighborhood protection overlay is a great tool for an individual neighborhood to preserve its character but cumulatively and collectively over time, as you've seen in Chapel Hill and Raleigh, who have dozens and more than a dozen in Raleigh, um, it becomes a significant constraint on housing supply and housing affordability. So we think it's really important if you could help us, we're, we're all ears, truly, to craft standards that are um, substantial, meaningful infill standards that are legally applicable and, and, and defensible that could be applied across the urban tier that allowed um, greater diversity of housing choice, but protected uh, protected character. We have we struggle daily to try to find that, and um, it sounds like you feel like we've missed the mark. I would love any input you have on, on the type of standards that we could apply more broadly that would get kind of that that deeper level of community buy-in. Um, this is something that all the communities that are looking at this issue are really, really struggling with. North Carolina has made it much, much harder by not allowing us to uh, regulate design or architecture. I'm a believer that if we could regulate design or architecture, we could get 90% of the way there, but we can't. I, I realize that. So. And I guess my final point, I, may, I have nothing to say. My final point is I am concerned that by doing all of this by right, uh, in further excludes ordinary people whose interest in the whole planning process is the homes that they buy or where they live from having an active ongoing role and say in the creating the regulatory environment of their neighborhood. I mean, zoning is the police power. It's, it's valid only if it protects the public welfare, but if we make it so that the public can't participate, uh, effectively in the process, and we've, be, we've done very good at this. Uh, I mean, we've pretty much reduced the public into coming to these hearings and saying no. They have no other role. And we're not even going to let them do that anymore. I object to that. I think that for at least some of these things, especially the duplex proposal, not having a use permit, which then would allow 
the Board of Adjustment to impose conditions uh, which would be enforceable under our existing statute for compatibility, uh, in my opinion, is I, a lot of my concern about this whole thing would go away as long as ordinary people would have a say in the way their neighborhoods change. Now, the great thing about a use permit, it doesn't come up and say, I don't like this, and then the Board of Adjustment says, well, nine out of the 11 people who spoke said they didn't like it. That's not a reason for turning it down. But I think we can have standards, especially um, as it relates to compatibility uh, and parking and some of the other issues that we currently address in our across-the-board standards for use permits that would allow some case-by-case consideration uh, and also allow ordinary people to continue to have a hand on the steering wheel of our of, of the creating our planning and zoning environment, uh, which they don't have right now. And that's my biggest concern about this. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Uh, Commissioner Williams and Commissioner Baker and then Commissioner Al Turk. I forgot. You forgot? We'll come back to you then if you remember. Commissioner Baker. Um, I think this is um, really good work, really important work. I definitely support uh, the, the spirit of the, uh, of, of the work that you're doing. Um, the contextual compatibility standards, I think, are something uh, that might need to be dug into a little bit more, it sounds like. Um, I do think it's possible to increase density in, in, in fill situations without um, ruining um, the character of neighborhoods. I think that we could actually enhance the character of neighborhoods. A lot of our favorite neighborhoods in the city are neighborhoods that have a variety of different housing types. Um, those tend to be historic. Um, I do think that you know something like this will probably go through, um, will be will be passed, will become um, you know local law. And I do think that there will be developers out there that will take advantage of it um, in order to um, build low quality development. And so I think that anticipating at, to the greatest extent possible, making sure that, that we're looking ahead um, to, to um, as much as we can um, is going to be really important. I also think that there's uh, some of the things that um, Commissioner Miller spoke about, um, you know, maybe um, thinking about how can we maybe not make everything by right, but we can say, okay, um, you know, you want to go up to two or three or four units. Um, you know, here's what you need to provide. Um, and I don't know, you know, I, I don't know quite enough about the case, um, about the lit state legislation um, in terms of, um, you know, what is actually allowed with design standards. You know, if there's some way of incentivizing um, um, higher density um, through design standards. Um, of course, it's, it's an incentive um, you know, for neighborhoods to allow, uh, you know, maybe something that's higher density, four or five units or more, um, with design standards, if that is possible. So that might be a way of, of encouraging people um, to support this. Um, so it, it seems like the, all of this is uh, geared toward infill development. I wonder if, as part of this, there's a look at um, any greenfill development, because, of course, you know, we're focusing a lot on on infill areas, um, a lot of people are being pushed out of these infill areas, and they're being pushed into um, automobile-oriented areas. And, and you know, low-income people living in automobile-oriented areas is kind of a recipe for disaster um, without access to transit. And so, I, I don't know if you can um, speak to um, anything that we're doing about you know neighborhood design standards or anything like that. Sure, for um, uh, for more of the suburban-style development. Um, we again um, are looking to change the cluster subdivision requirements, which we're seeing a lot more uh, requests for, and even the conservation subdivision requirements to allow more variety of housing types to be offered within those developments, uh, particularly um, duplexes throughout, and then even with conservation subdivisions, uh, townhouses too. Um, we currently also have a thoroughfare uh, density bonus um, that um, allows for townhouses. Um, this is, I, I believe this might be more urban tier if I'm remembering correctly, but I could be wrong. Um, but um, we are adding, um, this is the one place where we are uh, introducing a multiplex option 
uh, multiplexes are currently uh, a housing option within the UDO. Those are just kind of small apartment buildings, uh, three and four unit apartment buildings, and uh, proposing them uh, along major thoroughfares uh, and boulevards. Um, so we're, we're, we're starting to look into that. I think um, when we go through the comprehensive plan uh, process and take a look at how Durham sees itself growing in the next couple decades, we're going to have a better handle on uh, where to introduce these even more uh, uh, different, uh, more intense housing types, the, the, the three, four, five unit housing types, the garden style apartments, um, and then also uh, introduce a, a associated design standards for those too. Mm -hmm. Um, because we do anticipate there would be some uh, changes to the ordinance once the comprehensive plan is is adopted. If I just quickly add on to what Michael said, I, I think Commissioner Baker and Commissioner Miller, it, as I promised Commissioner Miller, we will absolutely take a very hard look at the infill standards and making sure that we go as far as we can under law to ensure that they are protective of existing character. But um, in terms of uh, and we will continue to evaluate and investigate this. We've done a lot of work already looking at peer cities and look, working with our attorney's office to test the realm of what's possible and legal. Um, we, it is legally possible to make a lot of what you heard from Michael um, approval through a use permit or some other uh, supplemental process. I think we have concluded that um, because of the limitations on design in state law on single family and two family units, there's no meaningful or substantial difference between one and two family units other than you know, we're allowing someone to create 100% more ha housing opportunities if they are able to build a duplex. Um, and that's why we haven't felt it was warranted or needed to have a, a, a supplemental use permit process. But we will um, take a look at that. I just want you to know exactly where we're at at this moment and we'll appreciate your feedback and we'll, we'll investigate that further. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Commissioner Aturk. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for your presentations. Um, I had a question about the survey. Um, do you have a sense of how um, representative it is of the population as a whole in terms of race, income, and geography? Um, of which the one that was done over the summer or? Yeah. The one over the summer, we did not ask those questions. Okay. Although, uh, from my recollection, and again, it's recollection, so don't hold me to it. It's okay. <laughs> usually pretty poor. Um, uh, that the, the response is that it was able to kind of track um, where people resided or where they were okay. um, uh, accessing it from. And it was actually somewhat, from my recollection, it was <clears throat> rather representative around different areas of, of Durham um, and, and outside of Durham, too. It even hit some places in, like, Europe, too. Uh, oddly enough. Um, uh, so, um, and I think even in <coughs> Antarctica was one place for whatever reason, but um, <laughs> um, but uh, it was that's one. A, um, that's in the rural tier. Yes, though. that's in the rural tier. That's, that's, <laughs> that, yes, yes, I, I believe those are, those are functionality errors. I, I was saying it in jest, so. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but it, it was okay. pretty representative throughout. Okay. I just want to make sure whenever Ge we're, geography wise, you know, 70% um, of people are okay with duplexes that it's not because they all live in right. Trinity Park or, you know. Um, okay, thanks for, uh, for that. I guess I have a couple of uh, small questions. Uh, one on the ADUs, I mean, and I, this was one of the things about the NPO that I did not like, which is the 800 square foot maximum. So I get that if, you know, you're trying to make it in some ways more flexible by taking away the 30%, but that could, that's also making it more restrictive if, I mean, what if, if one of the goals is to make ADUs uh, more prominent, not just in the urban core, but throughout, then I'm not sure what's the, what's the point of capping it at 800 rather than maybe increasing the percentage to say 50% or 60% and say, or maybe doing it to where if it's in the urban tier, you know, it's a maximum of 800. <coughs> if it's in the suburban, you can go up to, you know, 1,000 or 1,200 or something. Yeah. We certainly can invest, investigate that, um, Commissioner Alturk. I, I think that what was critical, we believed, was having a set maximum so that the uh, industry architects and designers and small builders could have a 
standardized plan that they could use. We're in fact working with um, um, American Institute of Architects local chapter on coming up with a possible standard design for the 800 square feet um, unit. Uh, and, but in terms of our, our one of our primary concerns to the comments that Commissioner Miller and Baker made was ensuring that accessory dwelling units remain accessory. I think we, we did do some investigation and research to show that um, if you've got a neighborhood, primarily single family houses, once you get over 800 square feet, there is some risk of it looking and feeling like a, like a second primary structure. So we will continue to, to investigate that idea for areas, suburban and rural areas where there's much larger lots, I think we could do that. Okay. But for the urban tier, we feel pretty strongly that 800 is, there's very few uh, housing units that are, there are some, but that are below 800 square feet um, in the urban tier. Okay. Thanks. Um, the other question is about duplexes. So um, now I can't remember exactly, but from what I, so the focus is on duplexes or changing some of the regulations within the urban tier. But again, it's, it's um, is there a reason not to extend that to the suburban tier? I mean, I, I get that some people, you know, a lot of people maybe in those neighborhoods are going to be against duplexes, but, you know, why not, especially in the, um, zoning designations that are a little bit more dense, like the RS 10 and 8, is, you know, well, why not allow duplexes there? I think we, we, could, we could look at that as well. I think there, there are two primary reasons. Uh, one is something I tried to allude to in my presentation, which is we wanted to really focus these changes where the highest demand was, and there's a, a tremendous differential, <clears throat> multiples four, five, six times uh, in terms of uh, per square foot in the urban tier, a lot of these urban tier neighborhoods than suburban. So we felt like the utilization of, of this availability would be a lot higher. Um, the second is that in the suburban tier, there's a much higher incidence of um, functional uh, homeowners associations with restrictive covenants that are, come with the, um, <coughs> would, would likely preclude, or even if our zoning allowed it, would prohibit or preclude the use of, of that. M many of these covenants and nationwide, they are something that restricts housing supply and increases, re reduces affordability, um, prohibit <coughs> anything other than single family units. Thank you. Uh, so I guess maybe the, the bigger question that I have is that, I mean, you mentioned how you're not focusing on multiplexes in this, in this at, at this stage. Um, and Pat, you also said, I mean, to quote you, you said this is a gentle approach. And I, I guess the question is, because at the beginning of the presentation, it almost seems like doomsday. Like, you know, we've got so many people, you know, invading the, you know, Durham and, um, and we don't have enough right uh, supply. And so why take the gentle approach and, you know, why not focus on multiplexes? Why not? Or what's, I mean, is, can you talk through the reasoning? Maybe I missed that or? Uh, sure. I think, that, I think there's two, two primary reasons. Um, one is practical and, and one is philosophical, if you will. Um, the philosophical one is, we think it's really important to have a greater level, even though we, I think we've done a really good job over the last seven or eight months, a uh, greater level of community engagement, uh, uh, listen, talking to communities and listening to communities about this problem, like we presented it to you tonight, um, so that we can get a higher level of buy-in from the broader community on, that, on those um, bigger scale solutions, the, multi, the garden apartments and the, and the fourplexes and more locations. So we think that the comprehensive plan, which we're going to be kicking off very soon, is a tremendous vehicle to do that. <coughs> we're going to have a consulting group that's going to help us with communication and outreach, and we'll really be able to essentially tell this story more effectively perhaps than I have tonight um, in, in more places in the community uh, before we propose those, those types of changes, which can be um, perceived and actually disruptive to communities. So that's one reason. The second reason is a practical reason. Um, as you all are well aware, zoning is only one piece of the puzzle, right? The other pieces are things like uh, stormwater requirements, um, roadway standards that require certain width of, of roads for uh, um, trash trucks and for fire uh, engine turnarounds and um, uh, utility standards that um, we believe if we go to three plexes, four plexes, or garden apartments, we have to look at these other standards uh, we have to make sure that we have um, fire and solid waste equipment that can go into smaller roads and it can service these higher intensity areas. We have to look at um, 
how we manage our stormwater standards that currently have to be on each individual site. So we felt like if we did uh, push for uh, um, more intense uh, range of uses and more locations, we wouldn't be able to implement them because of these other regulations impeding that. Does that make sense? That was very helpful. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, I know the hour is late. Uh, I did want to just say a couple quick things as we wrap up. Uh, Pat, I'm glad you raised the stormwater standards. I do think, I don't have a question, it's just I do think that's something we have to keep an eye on along with the tree canopy issue which you're working to address in this proposal. I've been impressed with the balance of trying to get a lot of public feedback, but also moving this through relatively quickly. So I think you've found that right balance. I do think something we really want to make sure we focus on is the post, you know, if this does indeed move forward and get approved, I think we have to really work hard to make sure we are continuing to engage and educate the public or else we'll see what we saw with Pinecrest where people were showing up and saying, when did this happen that our neighborhood changed our, uh, the tier we were in? And it went through obviously a very intensive public process, but it's easy to get through the process and, and say, great, we made it. But we need to really make sure we're educating the community to understand the changes that are coming here. I think we're striking the right balance, in my opinion, in terms of not moving too quickly. But I think we, being the planning commission, the elected bodies, and certainly the planning department, you guys, you're going to hear a lot if people start seeing the changes in their neighborhoods and they didn't understand. They just missed that there was this engagement process. So I'm hoping there'll be a post-education process as well that, that the staff could spend some time thinking about. Uh, with that said, I don't see any addi additional comments, so I do want to, uh, Commissioner, okay, L let's keep them quick because the hour is I late. I promise mine will be very short. Okay, Commissioner um, Williams. I just, I thought the presentation was awesome, like, to begin with, and as we address issues in terms of aging in place and these accessory dwelling units, and we're calling them granny flats, but the one thing that makes it difficult for the average aging adult is navigating stairs. So being able to create an environment where we're not only addressing the growth of Durham, but the retention of Durham citizens. So if we're not asking what your intended length of stay is in, in Durham or how long you've been here, the majority of the opposition that we receive are from those that are over 50 and over 40. And I'm approaching 40 myself, and I know a lot of my peers that are lifers in Durham, as I am, the question comes to me often is, it's affordable housing, but affordable for who? I've been in Durham my whole life, so what are they doing for us? Because we've survived housing crisis, we've survived economic crisis, we haven't left, and we're going to be here. So I think that getting that input will be invaluable to the planning commission because it will help into the planning staff because it will help people that are vested here and they want to remain here. And then we don't have these demonstrative changes because of the growth because we got to find that balance of how, how does growth and retention cohabitate in the same area. And I think that that pretty much sums up at least what I've seen throughout my tenure here. Great. Thank you. That's as brief as I could keep it. So. That was brief. Commissioner Gibbs. And this will be very brief. I, you mentioned storm water. Every time I hear water and the increased development and more and more people, I think of water supply, and I am talking about absolutely enough water. Uh, we're taxing our systems now, and with places like Chatham Park, I don't know where in the Dickens they're going to get all the water for that. But at any rate, I said I was going to be quick, and it is. Uh, if you'd pass along to the water people, uh, storm water and water supply is a big issue and has been with me for years. Thank you. Mr. Young, Mr. Stock, thank you both very much. Thank you. See this February. Uh, this is it for the meeting. Two quick final things. So number one, I did just want to let you know that between now and Tuesday, since it's a new year and, and it's been a long time since we've done this, we are going to work to rework our seating assignment. So the seating assignment is the, the chair has the ability at any time to change the seating assignments. We haven't done it in years. And so basically, as each of you have come in, you've just taken the place of the person who, who you replaced and the seat with that they've had. So we're going to work to rework the seating 
And so when you come here on Tuesday, we'll get this to you in advance. Don't just come and sit in your normal seat. Just take a moment and, and we'll figure out the, the new seating arrangement for the new year. Uh, the second and final thing I just see, anything else from staff for this evening? No, thank you. Not in, I was just going to think, unless you want to sit in someone else's seat and be them for the night, you could do that. Yes. We don't advise that you do that, though. And uh, if you have a seating preference, the, the bartering is open. <laughs> so, all right, with that, we're adjourned. Thank you all very much, and we'll see you on Tuesday. My preference is where I'm sitting. When do you want our comments?